Hello and welcome to Bend the Knee, a Song of Ice and Fire podcast. I am Sir Matt, the Bud Knight. And I am Sir Ezra, the Watchful. Welcome to uh, Follow-Up Friday. Uh, it is uh, June 29th. We're almost uh, at the end of June here. We've got several Ravens to go over. And by several, lot. I mean a lot, actually. Um, so that's a good thing. You know, we had a lot of people responding to last uh, our chapter on Bran uh, and, and the, uh, the Three-Eyed Crow discussion. So <laughs> lots to get to. But uh, first, Sir Matt, we have the winner of our trivia. Uh, to Sir Robert of Newcastle reclaiming his uh, throne, I guess. Uh, once again, coming in, he and Adam Parker seem to go head to head every week. Lord mm-hmm. Adam Parker um, edging each, ed- edging each other out, usually by a couple. Literally comes out of like twenty minutes. Is uh, wow. <laughs> what the uh, what what the difference is? But we had a lot of people actually respond uh, this week, so which is which is always good. More people coming in. The trivia question was: Who advised the Mad King to let the Lannisters into King's Landing? The answer is, of course, Lord Varys. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of, uh, or excuse me, the answer is Grand Maester Pycelle. Excuse me. A lot of people were answering uh, Varys, mm-hmm. but it's actually Varys who, ad- who advises against it. He's trying to protect the Targaryens, and Pycelle, who is actually you know working for the Lannisters, says, "No, you should let him in. He's your friend." Right, and isn't that interesting? Actually, yeah. When you think about all the things, uh, I mean, it makes sense, uh, Lord Py. Lord Pycelle, you know, that, um, you know, the friendship he has with the mm-hmm. Lannisters and things. But uh, but even Varys, though, it's it's even he's somehow protecting the Mad King there, you know, trying mm-hmm. to give him good counsel. But, yeah, I don't know, everything else that he does is, I don't know, it's just weird. Well, maybe Varys is uh, working with Rhaegar and he, he knows, you know, Rhaegar had been kind of planning trying to assemble a council mm-hmm. um, that's kind of what the tourney of heron hall was supposed to be well about. what's crazy is, is that varus actually warns the mad king to go yeah. to the tourney of heron hall because of rhaegar yeah so it's like weird so like you know because yeah there are some people who believe that maybe varus was trying to help rhaegar as you said but then at the same time if he was why not let him go we plot against his father we you don't know? know and there's then, so uh, many questions about uh about varus well I th- there's no rhyme or reason to varus varus just kind of does whatever yeah. Well, he says air quotes for the realm. For the realm. Yeah. yeah. But um, might be more for himself, his mm-hmm. family, friends. There are theories that Varys is either a Targaryen or a um, a Blackfire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And All I, very interesting. Yeah. Just real quick question about his potential thing as before we before we really get going here is you know sir ezra and i are always reading we're just always reading going <laughs> through things and i was uh, doing some world of ice and fire reading about Aegon the fourth who's coming up you know in a couple in a couple weeks and how mm-hmm. he le- legitimizes all of his bastards. he's kind of unworthy is right he? yeah the egg on the unworthy legitimizing all his bastards that's where you get into bitter steel and blood raven and blackfire rebellions and all this stuff and um you know it says that he slept with like he he, he he's quoted as saying he, he quoted as saying uh he, he said uh as he's Set up with like 900 women. So, what? Yeah. That's what he says. So he, and then he, oh, legit, yeah, he, he exaggerates. Yeah, he says that. He yeah. exaggerates okay. that. But it seems like he's sleeping with a different, like, woman all, every night, just mm-hmm. always having them bring them new, pe- new people. Yeah. So if he legitimizes yeah. all his bastards, that means there's countless Targaryens out there. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, bla- and black fires. Yeah. Interesting. Well, then, some people believe that um, if, you know, if, um, what's his name? Maley's the monstrous, the, mm-hmm. the last black fire that was su- mm-hmm. supposedly Sir Bar- Sir is it Sir Barristan. Yeah, Sir Barristan uh, Selmy kills yeah, him on the, on the steps. Yeah, yeah, um, could have been. Now, I, I, I recently was reading either on um, <clears throat> it was either on the Westeros dot org form or somewhere that uh, Varys could be from the female line because it very specifically says the mm-hmm. male line mm-hmm. um, for the black fires has ended. You know, so so yeah, there's a lot of theoretically different, a lot of different things that yeah it could be because we don't really yeah we don't really know what happens to. Uh, Bitter Steel, Igor Rivers. No, nope. yeah. So hmm. we have no idea. Yeah, I know. Unreal. So that was a good question, and uh, you know, I can see how people went, you know, back and forth. If you narrowed it down to those two, then you're, you know, yeah, you're in the ballpark. So, mm-hmm. okey doke. Um, poll results. Actually, I had a 
I think I think we're going to try to do this once in a great while here. We're going to have a, a, a poll up on the Facebook page. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please head on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash uh, bend the knee. Uh, we are working on getting a, um, a group together because we like people. Basically, if you find something in the Reddit you know, form or you find something in uh, westeros.org or whatever show news, that always is super helpful to Sir Matt because, mm-hmm. you know, he's always looking for show news and there's not much you know, right now, or right. as it com- comes in from different places, it's just nice to get help from you guys as to what's going on there. So um, if you could, you know, hop on the Facebook page and check that out. We'll get the group going and, and what have you. But I had a poll going here, and I said just who would win Clegane Bowl. Uh, it's, I'm just real simple one to start, and I think every week we're going to try to do one or so. And right now, overwhelmingly, 33 votes, 82% for the Hound, 18% for the Mountain. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know. Pretty straightforward. I just thought I'd share those. Just kind of fun. If you have uh, ideas on the polls, something you want, you know, us to kind of start and share, um, you know, give us a question with two options, and we'll we'll post it and, you know, get some response. Yeah. Feedback from the realm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's nice to do these polls. I think the last poll we did was uh, Team Annie versus Team Laurel. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> we did. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, all right, we have a lot of ravens uh, to get through today. Um, just real quick, I, I thought it'd be kind of cool just at the beginning to kind of say who who all we're going to touch today. Yep, that'd be yep. Uh, Robert of Newcastle sent us one, and he won the trivia, so he gets to go first. Uh, Lady Kelsey, we got Lady Jade. Uh, that's a new one. Mm-hmm. Um, Lady Kelly uh, Marino, I think her last name is. There's kind of a new one. Mm-hmm. Regine, we are hitting up yours today. Right, um, of course, Ghost of Heron Hall. Sam the Hammer, maybe just kind of we have him we have him tentative da- tentatively down as maybe he sent us a really long one and we don't know how long all this is going to go. We have Caleb right. the blacksmith as well. We also have Sir Grant the Yellow Knight. Yeah, earlier. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, sorry, mm-hmm. S- sorry, skip skip that one over. Yeah, we have a handful here, kind of about Three Eyed Crow slash Three Eyed Raven mm-hmm. to get through. It's a good thing Sir Ezra has been plowing through. <laughs> Uh, Brand, <laughs> I think you just finished, didn't you? I did. Uh, <laughs> you just, like this whole week, you've just been going through Brand. It's it's unreal. Um, lot there. There's mm-hmm. a lot there. Yeah, I finished so. a storm. I finished uh, Clash of Kings and a Storm of Swords, and I'm now working my way. I'm in a Dance with Dragons right now, currently. Yeah, the, which I, is my first read ever of a Dance with Dragons. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot there, isn't there? Mm-hmm. A lot there. Um, full disclosure, I actually, just for sake of time, I did bounce around in Clash of Kings. Wanted to see when Jojen first shows up and see their interaction between he and Bran. And then... Um, isn't that in, oh, it is in Clash of Kings, yeah. Yeah, and then once the once the kind of, you know, the sacking of Winterfell took place, I'm kind of like, okay, and once they start to move north, that first leg of their journey, it's okay. There's some stuff said yeah. by, by Jojen and stuff. And then I kind of speed on up to the wall you know, um, getting through the wall and then their interaction yeah. with cold hands mm-hmm. and then, you know, ultimately the three eyed crow slash mm-hmm. Brendan. Yeah. I haven't, I actually have Brendan. Yeah. I actually happened to read that chapter uh, as well. So, okay. So that's good. Cause we have a lot to talk about there. So let's jump into, uh, Sir Robert of Newcastle's, um, first uh, his his Raven here. All so. right. Here. Want me to read it? All right, sure. Gotcha. Hi guys. On Monday, you were talking about the three-eyed crow. I got to thinking: Does he know John is a Targaryen? Blood Raven has red eyes, and so does Ghost. Is he guarding John like a protective uh, great uncle? Ned says uh, in a Game of Thrones: Why are they this far south? Did he send them? He's ret- uh, referring to the direwolves, um, and that leads me to Mance Raider. Why did he kill John? Why didn't he kill John when he was captured? Is because Mance is Rhaegar. Uh, Mance is Rhaegar slash John's real father. Did Bloodraven let Rhaegar know he was going to die on the Trident and send someone in place knowing he would die on the Trident, but for a higher purpose? Wow. Mm-hmm. A lot of questions there. Mm-hmm. Um, the stuff we've been talking about actually for weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really. was good. When it, when it comes to these things. So just uh, kind of diving right in here. Does he know John is a Targaryen? Well, if he I'd put it to you like this, if he is a Targaryen, he knows it. Absolutely. Right. If he is a Stark. And if he is a, you know, Lady, Lady, mm-hmm. um, oh gosh, Chardains, yeah. Chardains, you know, uh, uh, son, then he knows that as well. Right. So I, you get from brand three in a dance of dragons that the, that, um, uh, Brendan or a if you know, I am still separating Brendan and the three eyed crow saying just, that even like though two, I've read it, like I just, you're saying, you're saying that it's that, that, that it's a, are you, are you saying that it's I'll, not blood Raven or that? No, it, no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm. I'm not. I'm. I'm saying that he's now kind of become someone else. I'm saying that while he is there with Brendan Rivers, 
Brendan. They call him Brendan. Okay. Yeah, okay. Clearly, that's Brendan Rivers. Yeah. Though. I'll give you that. But um, sometimes he refers to the person who's whispering to him as Brendan, yeah. Lord Brendan, even. And sometimes he refers to the whispers as the three-eyed crow. Yeah. And it just it is just different. So uh, more on that to come. But anyways, I think um, uh, you know, yeah, that he that he would know. Um, we, we've seen from that position that. Uh, Brendan can see, being the last green seer, can see back into time, just as Bran does, uh, you know, start to kind of work his, his powers there at the end of, of his last POV chapter, you know, we can see that he can look back into time. Yeah. And so they can do that if, if, if they chose to go. It also depends on what they go look at. Right. It's not and that they're all knowing, but it's just right. that they have the, the capability to, to go, go look. So that doesn't mean that they, that does, that doesn't mean that they know what to go look at. Right, like they they don't they don't yeah like they don't know everything that's ever happened, but they they can go look. But so that means they have to try and uncover events. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so you know it'd be sort of like uh, think about this for a second when the Vulture King rises out of Dorn and 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 is attacking, and they're unclear as to who the Vulture King is. There's another one who comes up after the Vulture King. You know, um, you could then see you, if, if you were a Green Seer, I think you could go back to that time and follow the the. Um, the Vulture King backwards yeah. to discover who he is. Where did he come from? That type of thing. It's yeah. so almost like major events have to happen and they have to follow it down as we do a rabbit hole mm-hmm. and ch- trace it back through. Um, so I think that's really, you know, the, the, the way uh, it works, I guess, mm-hmm. you know? So uh, other questions though that he had there. Uh, um, is he guarding John like a great uh, protective a lot of these kind of go together is he guarding uh john like a great protective uncle mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. yeah so that so that you know that's something we've kind of talked about quite a bit and this kind of ties into a lot of your question um is you know, we don't really know what the whole deal with with blood with blood raven and the three-eyed crow i kind of believe it was blood raven who maybe caused Rhaegar to one day just kind of suddenly decide to stop reading books and, and go fight. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, talks about like, did, could have blood Raven have communicated as the three eyed crow with Maester Amon. And then Maester Amon talks to Rhaegar. Cause we know that Rhaegar and Amon kind of communicated, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. to each other. A lot of these questions, you know, as we unfortunately don't know, Really, any of the any of the answers to these is kind of all. That's why they're the best questions. They are, yeah, yeah. They're just bigger, bigger, bigger theories, um, and that leads me to uh, into Mance Raider. Why didn't he kill John when he was captured? Now that is a really good. That's a good question because question. Um, I, I think hmm, he has sort of like a if if you believe Mance Raider is just Mance Raider and he was just, I don't know just a just a guy on the night on the Night's Watch. You know, then, and he sees someone else coming north and wanting to take the path that he took. Let's say we just take that yeah. approach. Then you could see why he might be sort of inclined yeah. to say, "I was there once." You know, yeah. I saw, once saw things as you did, and it's almost like he would. He like the idea of him taking yeah. John under his wing. Well, yeah, know? not only that, but maybe he sees it. I mean, obviously, you got to think think about this. Mance Raider just convinced all of the wildlings to rally underneath him. So he's obviously a very persuasive, charismatic guy. Mm -hmm. So he maybe looks at this as, oh, this is a chance for me to get somebody on the inside. Mm -hmm. You know, so we can, you know, I mean... Oh, sure. I mean, mean, he's far more valuable to John alive than... That or he's far more valuable to Mance. to Mance alive than he is dead. Yeah, yeah, like you maybe said, maybe you could use him as a prisoner. I mean, there's so mm-hmm. ma- there's so many more options. If you just kill him, well, then it's just another dead ranger. Mm-hmm. That yeah. doesn't that doesn't help you. I mean, you look at what they ultimately do with John is they try to send him. They do they send him over the wall, and he is able to help them navigate and figure out how to open the gate to let the wildlings through. Right. You know, so that's one of the things. And if that fails, then there's another option. You know, right. so uh, the king beyond the wall has many. Many different options and ideas and things that, that he's that he's thinking yeah. through. I just sort of think that, you know, the initial not wanting to kill him might be from some. I don't know that he had right. that master plan. I think he had the raid planned over the wall already. Right. John makes it better, but then also the idea that John, you know, wants to take off his black cloak and you know take up with the wildlings is right. 
probably appealing to Mance if he was truly, you know, a wildling. Yeah. So uh, then he kind of asked, is it because Mance is Rhaegar, you know, slash John's real father? So there is a lot of theories about is Mance Raider Rhaegar Targaryen? Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of goes into, you know, there are theories about Val, like, lots of theories, Corrin Halfhand um, theories. I think I, I'm i kind of more inclined on the Mance Ra- Mance is Arthur Dane. I think that uh, seems a little more, um, I'm a little more inclined on that. But the theory of him being Rhaegar does kind of make some sense. The idea that maybe perhaps Rhaegar was glamoured hmm. um, at the Battle of the Trident. He didn't go there. Hmm. Um there is wow. there is there is the talk that Re- that Rhaegar kind of knows the songs right he knows these like southern songs the Dornishman's wife the Dornishman's wife and he's also a singer Rhaegar was a singer Mance um, mm-hmm. also is kind of he kind of knows somehow Mance Ra- uh, Mance Raider scales the wall comes south and like is ahead of Roberts or, like catches up with Roberts mm-hmm. group as they ride to Winterfell and so that he can go be you know mm-hmm. a bard at the feast mm-hmm. yep yep. And so, how would he? How would he have that kind of a? You know, how would he have that kind of a knowledge? Mm-hmm. And yeah. also, why does he do it? Does he do it just to do it? Yeah, I mean, to to go see this. Ah, you know, if he is Rhaegar, that that connection to go see his old rival. Yeah, you know, Robert Baratheon. That's yeah. interesting. Never really thought about that. Yeah, nobody know? really ever kind of talks about why he does it. They just talk about oh, he does it. Uh-huh. So it. Yeah. But why does he do? It? Maybe he wants to go. What does he want to go see? Maybe, 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 maybe it's a way for him to actually go lay eyes on John because he does kind of talk to to John about how he was there. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's just a way for him to kind of see if Jon Snow is his son. Um, hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you know, the, the other piece too is like um, in these characters, you know. I was watching an interview uh, last night where Kerr was talking about how, you know, they uh, when when things are passed on through point of view, they miss over they they misinterpret things or they hear things wrong or sometimes they even are deliberately untruthful. And right. They're, and they're or, some, or sometimes Gurr just doesn't include something. He was it was that it was really interesting that that interview we were reading where he said yeah. that he's really received thousands of questions about that chapter why isn't Bran mentioned when they're talking about all oh, people yeah. coming in and Gurr's honestly like I think I just forgot to include Bran yeah, Bran like, was I, there I, I just, but he's like he's like but I guess you know to like analyze it maybe John happened to look away like and didn't yeah. see Bran walking down right yeah yeah but uh the, the point I was driving to there is that you know when Mance Raider is talking about um Val and Della you mm-hmm. know on his on his way north and how he comes across them Maybe there's more to that story. You know, I'll, I'll give you one possible situation. If, if he is Rhaegar, and he did somehow get, um, you know, out, out of the Trident and up to the Night's Watch, and everything's underway, the whole situation with the Tower of Joy, all the, these plans are in motion. Right? He gets there, perhaps. Oh crap! I'm, I was almost about to spoil one of my theories. Yeah, don't don't don't, don't no, say it. Don't no, say it. No, I know. I, yeah, yeah. Don't say that. So so then there's there's an idea though that like the connections that he makes beyond the wall might have already been there before. So what he calls a, a happen you know, this 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 chance meeting between him and some wildlings. Again, as we had mentioned with uh with Tormund, that perhaps that is someone else who just went on before him, paved the way. Right. You know, integrate with them, send your people, your loved ones, your family, you know, on up to the wildlings and then he them he himself then, you know, follows and pretends like he did not know who they were, pretends yeah. like he had no and and then if those people have Establish good rapport, and they elevate mm-hmm. him easier for him than to become a prince, and then and then he turns into a king. You know, yeah. the king beyond the wall makes a lot of sense. But yeah, uh, anyways, it, it does. Yeah, the is man's. Uh, there's actually a lot of good YouTube videos on that, and I think there's definitely some compelling evidence for. It. I would say though, for me, that part, I had the uh, him being Arthur Dane seems to make slightly more sense to me. And I do believe, as you get into this next one, did Blood Raven uh, let Rhaegar know he was going to die on the Trident and set someone in his place knowing he would die on the trident but for like a higher purpose so kind mm-hmm. of was Rhaegar glamored at mm-hmm. at the trident so that could mean that that is kind of part of the theory is that i actually the more i kind of get into it the more i actually think Rhaegar didn't die mm-hmm. on the trident they um there's a Jamie chapter in a clash of kings um i think it's one of the last Jamie chapters he's kind of having like a dream um, or excuse me, in it's not a Clash of Kings, it's in a Storm of Swords, um, where Jamie is just kind of dreaming about stuff, and he's dreaming about um, when he was a kid, and 
Rhaegar. He's dreaming about Rhaegar. Mm-hmm. He's talk. He talks to Rhaegar before he before yeah. he leaves, and he specifically like, last thing, just a kind of little thing, mentions like he had all these rubies on his on yes. his chest. He's describing his armor, right, right. Yeah, and he, he he specifically remembered all of the rubies on his yeah. on his armor, which. I mean, yeah, keep in mind, yeah, you're a Targaryen, Mm -hmm. like, and you are the crown, but, I mean, doesn't it just seem odd Mm -hmm. that you would have rubies on your armor? Well, my question is, did he ever wear that type of armor in in combat or trial or tourneys tourneys, before? I mean, like, there's one thing about that, you know, it is, like, you hear about people having, like, ornate you know ornate weapons and ornate shields especially like tourneys and stuff right but it's still Good while point. it's while it's ornate it's like practical yeah i like i mean yeah don't get me wrong rubies and diamonds and all that stuff is obviously hard to cut but it just seems slightly unpractical to have yeah this like it's almost more of like a ceremonial type of armor yeah right where you'd have rubies on it yeah it is interesting it's an interesting choice you know yeah, uh, for sure. You know, one thing I want to say before we go further, too, is we often, all of us, because we're super fans and, and, we, and we love this, you know, at one point or another, I just want everyone who's listening to to remember that we we don't think everybody lives. You know, some people no, do yeah. die, you know, but it is, ni- it is nice to kind of speculate that if one person would live, then this person would maybe die. So if it's Rhaegar, who's Mance, then perhaps Sir Arthur Dane dies. Maybe they yeah. both didn't live. You know, things like people, we speculate, right. did Ned l- live on in war? You know, at some point, no, I do, there's I more think, of a realistic right. type of writer to where, no, they just died, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's part of life, and that's the tale. Right. So. But when you see characters like Catelyn Stark. Exactly. Right. No, it's, there's, yeah. there's evidence, there's a lot of evidence that um, people are not who they are. You know the fact that yeah. Mance is glamored, you know, to go south with uh, with the, with the wives to save an AKA air, air, air quote Arya Stark is another piece too. It supports the whole idea of yeah. you know other people being glamored and you know we've got uh, Blood Raven himself using the Moonstone to mm-hmm. to glamour himself um, for the second Blackfire Rebellion. So stuff right. like that is interesting. I just wanted to throw it out there because we speculate a lot on Follow Up Fridays about. Who could live? Who, who could, could die? Who could die? Kind of yeah, stuff. that's the fun part with it. So. Yeah, I don't know. I, I yeah, when it comes down to that, I, Ned Stark, I don't. <clears throat> I think he's definitely dead. Lyanna Stark's obviously dead. I I think I think the idea of Arthur Dane or Rhaegar, I think it's one or the other. Obviously, I I I'm more inclined on Arthur Dane, but I, I don't know. Part of me still believes Rhaegar. I, it just seems it seems unlikely that Rhaegar would do that. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean he's still alive. Could have died another way, but yeah. Okay. All right, let's move on to uh, Lady Kelsey here. Mm -hmm. I'll read this for you. Um, Maybe it was the three-eyed crow that lured the man who was turned into the Night King north. Maybe he was a student of the three-eyed crow, like Bran, who became too powerful. So the crow and the children uh, turned on him or tried to turn. Maybe the Night King is just trying to save Bran or reach Bran because uh, Bran can save him. Uh, from his prison of being the Night King. A lot of interesting stuff there. So, the Three-Eyed Crow luring a man um, who was turned into the Night King north. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, trying to th- I'm trying to think through this real quick. What do you think about that, Sir Matt? Uh, the Three-Eyed Crow lured a man... So, okay, I yeah, so... Yeah, so we know that like the children, at least in the show, it's 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 shown to us that the the children kind of created the Night King, right? And it was almost like, yeah, or or the or the or the the others, right? With the with the right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that the Night King though? Uh, I because the, the story of the Night King is that, I think that it, he. I, I want to say actually, it's the same actor. I have to look that up. Well, I'm just saying, like, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're talking about the. St- I said the show. Yeah, the show, yeah. I, said, okay. I said I said the show because in the books we don't know. In the books, the Night King isn't like a character. Well, in the, in the books, the Night King is is referred to as the right. 13th. Lord yeah, Commander. like yeah, they're different. They're di- they're different kind yeah. of they're different kind of things. Could be the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, really, in the books, like the others aren't really like shown that mm-hmm. much. Mm-hmm. They're way more heavy mm-hmm. in the show because you know it's you, it's kind of. I mean, how many how many actually others do we see in the in the books? You see the one in like the prologue, and then you see the one that Sam kills. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I we think, just know they exist. Yeah, and like they're always they're always kind of. Yeah, I think I understand Lady Lady Kelsey's question a little bit better. Sometimes we right. don't have a chance to kind of read through all of these, but I think 
I think this might be more show, and I'll even tie it to book two. I'll answer it both ways. So if it's the show, um, and it's and it's the, as, as you said, if we see them creating the Night King, I was confused, I'm sorry, yeah. the Night King in the show, you know, which uh, would be the the great other with the with the blue eyes and all that good stuff, you know, um, we do see them in that, that that tree with the with the uh, the stones in a circle, and it's it's um, looks like a ceremony. They press dragon glass into his chest, right. and his eyes turn blue. So perhaps the three eyed crow lured that man who was turned into the night king north. So perhaps this guy right. was lured there. Maybe he was the student of the three eyed crow, like Bran, who became too powerful. So the crow and the children turned him, turned on him, or tried to um, tried to turn. Yeah. So I, I guess that the idea is that if, let's say he is he's a student, you know, this guy before they press that dragon glass into his chest, he is a student with the three eyed crow, um, but he is learning too much, as you had said, you yeah. alluded to. Is Bran more powerful than Blood Raven? Right. Is he a better Green Seer? Can he do more? Can he influence the past? Right. Where, where Blood Raven says that you can't. Um, you know, then uh, is it one of those things where he got too powerful? And he started to create the others, mm-hmm. or he was he became a servant of the great other, and then they decided to turn on him. Yeah, remember we I think we actually mentioned that either last Friday or yeah we had we had one, show we, yeah we had one a while ago where they talked about how I can't remember who it was that asked it something about like you know the children of the forest created the others as like a super weapon, and then it was like uh, you know it's kind of bad. It's almost like, they're about, like he was talking about like nuclear yeah. weapons. Like once you kind of have it, then mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. uh, like what you know yeah. It kind of creates more problems than, yeah. Right, yeah. So, so I don't know. Um, that, that's an interesting one, L- L- Lady Kelsey. I think the idea, too, the last bit is probably the, the most important. Maybe the Night King is trying to save Bran or reach Bran because Bran can save him from his prison of being the Night King. Almost like he could then be laid to rest if he can bring someone as powerful as himself to fill that position for the great other. Yeah, it's kind something. of like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, it's been a good while since I've seen this, uh, in like Pirates of the Caribbean, or Caribbean, however you say mm-hmm. it, like Davy Jones' locker, like there always has to be like that guy. Oh, yeah. Isn't that kind of how it works? Yeah, sort it's, of, yeah. It's like, it's, it's, a, like, it's like once Orlando Bloom, I don't, can't remember, like kind of takes that role, then the other guy can like, I think that die, but there always has to be someone in yeah. that role. That happens in a lot of curses and different right. stories and mythologies and stuff where someone has to, yeah, take the place for somebody else so that way they can endure this long. Right. You know, it's what's it is really what Bran is actually kind of doing. He is being lured yeah. uh, north to take over for the for Brendan. Mm-hmm. I'll say Brendan. He's he's taking over for for, for Brendan. Blood Raven. For Blood Raven. Yeah. yeah for, for <laughs> that's and that so that is that that's that's what he's doing. Um. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I'm going to talk about that later. By the way, I have a huge passage I want to read here later. So we're just getting through a couple of these uh, three-eyed crow, you know, Yeah, these are just kind of the then, questions that can set up a big, much bigger discussion. Yeah. Here, mm-hmm. so. Okay, so let's move on to Sir Grant and then we'll, we'll continue. Lady Kelsey, we actually, I just had another thought. We'll circle back to that in just a second here. So, yeah. okay, Sir Grant, uh, the Yellow Knight. Well met, fellow knights. I would like to play a little game. Well, this is a tough one, by yeah. the way. And so, not only do we have I think the it's like ghost, one of these seven questions type. Thing, well, this yeah. is great. It's actually it's actually a really good um, way of deducing information. Yeah, kind of, kind of, you know, kind of deducting down to, to the the core of this. So um, he says, "Well met, fellow knights. I would like to play a little game. I like to ask myself a series of questions to guess the true intentions of people." Okay, so here are the questions: mm-hmm. Who is the actual ruler of the seven kingdoms? Who has been known to drive people mad? Who were the first inhabitants of Westeros? We know King Aerys was mad, but what happened to him? Did Bloodraven control his mind, similar to Bran controlling Hodor? Is the Three-Eyed Crow manipulating past and present, controlling the Seven Kingdoms to his desire? Could the Three-Eyed Crow be choosing future heroes for the Great War to come? Where in the hierarchy do the Children of the Forest fit uh, what I know for sure is I need more information, Winds of Winter. Yeah. Yes, true. We all do. Uh, we all do. <laughs> um, figuring out how the three, how, how these pieces, uh, so here are the pieces, uh, work together here. These, these are the pieces he's talking about. So the Three-Eyed Crow, the Others, the Children of the Forest, Starks, and the Old Gods. So I need to figure out how those fit together. Um, you know, they've been a little clouded in the TV series. Yes. Looking forward to your opinions, uh, the opinions you might give. Keep it the good work. Uh, I'll leave uh, his house words. I love this. The Yellow Knight, uh, fit to fight. Mm-hmm. Great. 
actually. So uh, thank you, Sir Grant. We appreciate it. Um, yeah, that is sort of what I've been kind of uh, for the last couple of weeks trying to boil things down to is how do all of these things work? I think you had a lot of correspondence with Lord Adam Parker on this. I was kind of watching from a distance um, about he, he had a lot of things to say, I think, on yeah, here, the three-eyed look. crow and, and yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, the old I'll, gods. I'll, you I'll know? pull that up while you're, um, uh, okay. while you're going here. So, um, so who's the actual ruler of the seven kingdoms? You know, it's basically, I think you take it all the way to the top as we did on Monday. You know, who is moving the pieces? You know, um, basically the question here, I think, you know, uh, that Sir Grant's driving at, you've got King Ares, you know, um, when he is ruling, um, you've got someone perhaps, maybe Blood Raven, controlling him. Well, who's controlling Blood Raven? You know, is it the Three-Eyed Crow? And is the Three-Eyed Crow just, uh, you know, um, manifestation of the Great Other? Is that how he appears to us? Is that what we call him, the Three-Eyed Crow? But really, it's this, it's this Great Other God. You know, and then you get into the old gods and the children. How do they fit into this? So really it is, who is, manipul- who is the um, puppet master, right? You've got a puppet, the Mad King, um, you know, and, and, and other, you know, um, great lords and things. You've often said this. Sir Matt has said that Blood Raven, you know, is behind everything, okay? Uh, Perhaps yeah. behind everything. Well, then the question for me is, who's behind him? He's just a man. He's just uh, the last of the green seers. How do the gods play into this? You know, and, and I will say, uh, and, and so spake Martin, you know, one of the things that he said is that um, no god is going to just step out onto Westeros and the gods aren't going to come down to, to, to duke it out, is right. essentially. You know, they're, they're, gonna use they're playing people. this game th- th- themselves. Um, so, the way I have been trying to, um, to think about this, the old gods and the werewoods, right? And, and, and um, oh gosh, m- more gods of nature, okay? And, and I, I just started thinking about this this, this week. Relor being the, the the Lord of Light, you know, fire, those mm-hmm. types of things, and the old gods um, seem to be like um, the gods of the of the earth and nature and springs and and and, uh, and trees and stuff like that. And then, but also, as I just read in Brand Three: A Dance of Dragons, there's a lot of this um, them being in the earth. They talk a lot about the darkness and letting the darkness consume you and being okay with being in dark places. Um, so I really don't know how, how the old gods match up against the great other. Melisandre sees, you know, um, the great other in her, in her flame. So you've got her Rolor, her, her god, you know, seeing the great other. But then you think about the old gods. What part do they play? So I guess I'm going to try to not, um, let's put these into, in different categories. Let's say that the great other and, and and the others, mm-hmm. you know, and the whites, white walkers, whatever, they're all in one branch. They are in the land of always winter. That's where they belong. That's where they're at. Okay. And let's say the children of the forest belong, you know, they worship the old gods and the werewoods are a part of that. And they just now have been moved mo- north of the wall. Sometimes I think because of proximity, we think that they're, I, I sometimes have made the mistake of thinking that they're a little closer to the great other than I would like, but they could still be. Maybe not the nicest or the best or the prettiest of gods. Right. They could still deal in dark shadows and you know and in the earth. And it seems creepy when Bran's in there with them. And it seems very weird, you know. Um, uh, but perhaps, but yeah. so so there, there's that whole group. So you've got the others, the old gods, and Rolor. And then as we said, we've got the seven and all the on the other groups. But the major players right now are the others and. And, and R'hllor, those seem to be the two that are kind of rising right now that are going to fight this song of ice and fire. But it seems like the old gods are in the middle, kind of directing things in some way. Right, like they've gone away. People forget them. They're kind of this forgotten, mm-hmm. you know, group that's that was worshipped. And I don't know. You know, that's I, I'm, st- I'm just trying to separate the the, the three and, and think about them in that way. So, yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of like um, you know the gods are playing the Game of Thrones. You know, as as, yeah. as 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 you think about it, you know, you have the seven that came over and they kind of took away most of the old gods, but then some of the they stayed. And like, remember on Pike, we we met, talked about how um, they tried to instill the old gods, but then it didn't work. And then the drowned gods stayed. Um, right, it just it just kind of happened to be there. So you got to, I guess, think that that the that these gods are kind of 
playing, you know, the Game of Thrones as well, and they're going to use their yeah their weapons to to fight each other. Let's do this real quick. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, Sir Matt, and it's, they're 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 easy. But I just want put them. Just use your gut and tell me where of those three different guys. You've got the Great Other, mm-hmm. you've got the Old Gods in the middle, and then on my right, you've got um, Relor, the Lord of Light. So if I said Three Eyed Crow, yeah, where does that go? Where three- does that go with the Great Other? Does that go with <sighs> the Old Gods, or does that go with Relor? Well, definitely not Relor. Uh, well, right? here's the thing: is that the Great Other is what I would consider an old god. Okay, that's what I want to. Yeah, say. that's why. That's is, why is I, I don't. I, know. I think. I think they they go together. And this is this is the thing: is it's so all you about, wouldn't separate them that, that no, way. No, no, no. It's all about perspective. The more I'm starting to look at it, is they're in. I think it's John one or two. It's the chapter in A Dance of Dragons where. Melisandre is destroying the so-called horn of Jorman, right? Mm-hmm. Remember, she mm-hmm. takes it and she lets yep. all, they let all the wildlings through, and they say, "As right. long as you swear to Relore," and then she gives them like pieces of weirwood yep. to cast into this fire. Yep. Um, and there's just some interesting there's some interesting lines there. I just listened to it today, so um, where it's J- John's perspective, and uh, he's talking about like Egret, and he says like you know like Egret was kissed by fire, right? The hair. And he's like, but mm-hmm. Melisandre, who also has red hair, yeah. is fire. Uh-huh. Yep. And he and he ta- and he talks about that. And then also when I just kind of think about the gods, you know, think about this from the children's perspective, they were just there, right? Yeah, they were there in Westeros. And then you have like the Andals and the First Men yeah. and the Valyrian. All these people come over yep. and force them out and tear down their trees. Yep, and you know, so from their perspective. You know, that like they're the ones being oppressed. Absolutely. Yeah. Y- y- like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so they back in the day, they worshiped the old gods. Yeah. This is where it gets confusing to me. Right. Is that when the so you would you, you would lump in the children. So here's my question. Then though. are the children working with. So because, as you said, they right, worship the the, they worship the old gods. And if you lump the the old gods in with the great other, then does that mean the children are working with. The other, the other, possibly, or See, they, my, or, they or, or it could be, or it could be separate because, um, it's God's plural. So maybe there's something else there. Well, but. we'll think about this is that the gods also probably evolve and change over time, right? Like think about the many faced God, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and then like Jack and Jahar, um, t- tells Arya like, well, because they were gonna die, right? Remember, they were gonna burn to death in the mm-hmm. in the in the cage, and Arya lets them out, and that's how she gets the three things. He's like, you caused Relor, you've you've cost Relor essentially the Lord of Light three deaths. Mm-hmm. Um, but then later they talk about you know that there is the you know just there's like the God of Death, and there's all these different yeah all these all these different gods, and some people think that the House of the um, Black and White you know say that correctly uh-huh. they w- actually work for the great other um which is also like the god of death and melisandre actually kind of explains it a little bit um obviously it's from her perspective it's in the chapter of uh a storm of swords or a clash of kings uh, one of the two um no it's a storm uh, i think it's a clash of kings where davos is in the cell mm-hmm. um and she's gonna take the light away and she tells him all about it and she says you know light and death ice and fire all of this kind of stuff so I, I I think that they evolve over time and they'll pick different people to kind of be their champions and stuff like that. So, um, right. I, I don't know. But then you have like uh, Leaf, right? And the children who are helping are helping the three eyed crow, right? And they have right. magic to keep the whites out. So if they if the if the whites were to say work for the great other. And the three eyed crow is also working for the, for the great other. Then why would they need to protect themselves from the whites? Gotcha. But then again, we say that one more time. Okay. So you have the children of the forest, correct? Mm-hmm. Who, you know, if, if they were working for the great other, which some people believe, mm-hmm. why yeah. would they be protecting the three eyed crow who could work for the great other? And ha- need to have a, a cave with magic around it so that whites didn't attack them. If whites also, I think, is safe to say work for the right. I'm just saying because when I ask you, yeah, you know, earlier you said you this, that that you said that the other that the great other could be one of the old gods. Well, I think it is. I think it is an old god. I almost the way that they just describe old gods is just kind of it's. Let me bring a little clarity. It's to this. it's yeah. It's 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 different. It's it's. I think I think it's more of like think about how like native americans 
view re- like religion mm-hmm. or at least you know like did back in the day i um you know where it's kind of like the stream and you know there's other religions that kind of view right. that where they, where they view like okay trees and all everything kind of has its own purpose its own god mm-hmm. that's what i think they refer to as the old gods and the seven kind of have chosen these like seven aspects or like champions like the mother and stuff like that and even the seven has what is it the um what is their what is their uh, one of death uh, stranger, the stranger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So they have like you know they just view it differently. Yeah. Okay. Here, let's bring a little clarity to this because I, I went ahead and looked up a few things here. Yeah. Uh, the old gods are nameless deities of stream, forest, and stone. They were worshipped in the seven kingdoms of Westeros and beyond the wall. They are so named because the faith of the seven became the new gods when the Andals, you know, um, you know, came into Westeros. Um, let's see. They are the this religion is still practiced by northern men, Cranach men, and and free folk. So those are the, the the groups that still worship the old gods. The old gods are are based out of like this sort of um, Wicca Celtic system, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the free folk beyond the wall believe that the gods are everywhere in the rocks, the streams, the birds, the beast, uh, and that they take um, the decent down into the, the deceased down into the earth and and trees. Maesters teach that the werewoods are are sacred to the old gods. Um, you know, however, worshippers believe that the old gods watch through the trees. It's said that the old gods only have power where the heart tree faces can see, and since the destruction of most of the, most of the heart trees in the south, south they have no power there. Now, another thing I just read on, on R'hllor. But isn't the uh, Isle, Isle of Faces down there? That's where all the weirwoods are? Yeah, it's kind of towards the, uh, the neck, though. It's just south of the neck. Yeah, it's like right by Harrenhal. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's so, but there's still a lot of south. Yeah. 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 Like Dorn, and there's yeah, some yeah, yeah. the Reach and everything, uh, or the Westerlands and stuff like that. Um, now, Relore, though, in the Relore faith, there are two. Uh, you have Relore, the Lord of Light, and then you have like the Great Other. So, um, as they call the Great Other here, Melisandre would say the Great Other is the God of Darkness, Cold, and Death in the faith of Relore. So it's something that's inside that faith. Right. So I think that helps me understand a little bit better because inside of the R'hllor faith, there is just one God, which is R'hllor, and then his opposite, the Great Other. His true name is never spoken. He is considered the enemy of R'hllor, who is the Lord of Light. Uh, Followers of R'hllor believe that there are only two gods, R'hllor and the Great Other, who wage an eternal war over the fate of of the world. All forces... Uh, of darkness, cold, and death are believed to be servants of the great other. Uh, Melisandre refers to the others as the cold children of the great other. The great other has never been mentioned by any Westerosi, although all know the others from legend. According to Melisandre, sleep um, is a little death. Dreams are whisperings of the other who would drag everyone into his eternal night. Now, so when you think about dreams, the things that Bran, this is why it's been it's been tough. The old gods, um, people start to kind of see that like like giving over to um, tree dreams, you know, mm-hmm. and wolf dreams, things like that. And then when Melisandre says something like, you know, dreams are whisperings of the other who would drag everyone into his eternal night, dreaming being something you do at nighttime, you know, and the long night coming and being associated with the great other. I think there's that's does that make a little more sense mm-hmm. i guess you know and so it helps me anyways um I, I think the faith of the seven is just a facade it's not nothing there is no power there at all it's just something that they it's a hierarchy that they set a system of power and controls it's another whatever i could be wrong but i'm just yeah. saying that's my that's my well, thought i mean but the, now real yeah, quick okay, the, yeah, yeah. the children the, the children of the forest though they worship the earth and the and the, the trees and the and the ground and the streams and the birds and the beast and the land or whatever and that is not what the great other, you know, um, is all about. So it, you can, I guess in my head, I have to kind of separate the two. So here's the thing. In Melisandre's view, when she looks at, remember when she sees in her flames and she sees Bran and she sees, she sees um, the three-eyed crow slash Brendan Rivers, yeah. she thinks they're servants of the great other. So she, she puts, she in her mind lumps the old gods in with the great other, which is confusing to some of us. But maybe there's, again, from that's just her point of view, um, there's a misunderstanding. And the others are separate. That's why I put them in three separate categories to begin with. On my left, 
I have the Great Other in the middle. I have the Old Gods, and on the right, I have uh, Rolor. Rolor and the Great Other are fighting over top of the Old Gods, and the Old Gods are underneath just kind of forgotten. Mm -hmm. They're like lesser, weaker gods, kind of like Mother Roin from Essos, mm -hmm. a god that really is not a big player anymore, perhaps, or something. And again, they all could be one and the same. <laughs> it yeah. could just be just what we call them and what we term them. Well, like know? right, like right here, I have I have the the stranger pulled up. The stranger is one of the seven aspects of a single deity. Believer uh, believers of the faith of seven consider their god to be one with seven aspects. Yep. So they actually, maybe not entirely like Christianity, where you kind of have like the uh, Trinity, the Trinity. Yeah, mm -hmm. like we've well, got like the the three different aspects of it. Um, I guess that's not a really good example because in Christianity, you just kind of have one god and you don't really doesn't really well i guess he kind of does multiple things i don't know but um so yeah you know i don't know when it, when it comes to like just think about um religion though in our world like we'll just take christianity for example it could be now gur has never said this um but that people have different understandings everybody mm -hmm. has their own kind of different understanding of religion yeah because and when we when you look at christianity i mean which which version of Christianity is is right? You know, you've yeah. got like how many? Yeah. There's like thousands of sects of Christianity. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yep. I think you and I are even the same. We grew up the same like sect of Christianity and yeah. totally different. Totally, like, different. totally, yeah. oh, totally yeah. different. Oh like, yeah, for sure, for sure. And I think that's exactly what Gur's trying to show, <laughs> right? In his in his writing. But I want to. There's elements of fantasy here, and yeah, I want to. There I wanna, was too. Yeah, for sure. I, I want to make one more note here uh, while we're talking about the Great Other, because then we'll move on to more ravens. Uh, but this is what happens. Um, so at the wall, when as I said, when she's gazing into the flame, she sees a wooden face, corpse white. A thousand red eyes and a boy with a wolf's head beside him. She mm -hmm. thinks to herself that they must be the great other's champions, um, as King Stannis is her, Relor's Rel champion. You know, further evidence in the text uh, ties the last green seer, Brendan Rivers, and the old gods and Bran Stark to the theme of darkness. Mm -hmm. Okay, that draws the great other into opposition with Relor. So one of the visions that she has, you know. Um, Let's see. Oh, oh actually, uh, Blood Raven and, and, Br and Bran have this exchange, I think. Um, there he sat, listening to the hoarse whispers of his teacher. And his teacher says this, Never fear the darkness, Bran. The Lord's words were accompanied by a faint rustling of wood and leaf, a slight twisting of his head. The strongest trees are rooted in dark places of the earth. Darkness will be your cloak, your shield, your mother's milk. Darkness will make you strong. And actually, Bran, when he drinks the weirwood paste the, from the seeds, right. he is actually wetting himself to the tree, the, the weirwood tree. So it's just the, it's just the fact that the, it is, seems so dark and shady and mm -hmm. uh, get that yeah. shade tree, you know, yep. shady. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that there's some kind of, uh, that, there, that there's, that, that Melisandre, I can see why Melisandre makes that mistake, but yeah. perhaps they are very different things. Right. So. Yeah, just really. And two, two last points here on, okay. on this. And I think I, I've mentioned this before is like if you look at Essos, um, like the Dothraki worship horse, like there's yeah. a horse, right? Yeah. Like and the great stallion and stuff like that. Like if you look at what the children are worshiping, that's like the same type of thing. Mm -hmm. Like that, like to, like if that were in Westeros, you would say, well, that's an old god. Yeah. The, you know, right, right. Same type of thing. And it could be. Um, and it could be. Now, I, I've, I think I've brought this up before and I'm going to reference something totally nerdy here. But. In Xena Warrior Princess. Jeez. <laughs> in Xena Warrior Princess. What kind of happens is um, you have, like, you know, you have, like, the Greek, right, gods, right? And they, they end up kind of dying out because nobody's worshiping them anymore. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. like, you kind of have, like, you know, like, just the regular god kind of come in um, because everyone starts to worship him. They don't, they kind of change the way they do it in that show but um and maybe that is actually kind of what is happening here is that these gods you know we, remember we talked about like mother Roin, like the turtle god or whatever and it just kind of gets wiped out and so it's kind of it's kind of like whoever's worshiping them like that's how they get power yeah yep well that's something i mean that's a theme in, in game of thrones and the whole since song of ice and fire you know series is Tyrion when he tells his um the riddle, I think he's talking to Varys, or I'm not sure who it is, but he's talking about, you know, the king, the swordsman, and the rich man mm -hmm. who has the power. And then power is in who you believe. Is it is it yep. in is it in money? Is it in is it and in a king that, who's who's maybe that's the ultimate maybe yeah. that is the ultimate thing is who whoever you believe has power is ultimately who has power. Yeah. Because look at 
um, look at uh, when the High Septum and the Sparrows, right? Yeah. When they suddenly, out of nowhere, claim control because they've kidnapped Cersei. And then, you know what I mean? And, and Tommen keeps going there and praying with Marjorie. And the next thing you know, they're in control. Uh-huh. Like, out of nowhere. Yep. So, Yep. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's get back to um, some of these. You know, Sir Grant, I'm not so sure I answered any of that, but I just wanted to kind of <laughs> get into the how are they all related, um, where do the Starks stand, who's who's allied with who, who is the major, you know, puppet master type of thing, pulling the strings, is there anyone, you know, Could, type yeah. of thing. Is it all just sort of a, you know, I don't know. Okay, Lady Jade. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'll re- um, go for it. I'll read this. Yeah, new uh, new kind of person here. This is kind of cool. She kind of yeah. sent us a, a double. She sent us one and then kind of came back to it um, from England. And I will say this. We've been getting a lot of people from England and Norway, and it's just crazy. It's time for us to travel. It is time for us. Is I just got my passport, so I'm good to go. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it's just crazy. Like every time I see, every time we see somebody from like a different country, it's just like, yeah. Wow. I am going to Scotland next year. So yeah. if if uh, next summer, if yeah. I have anybody from Scotland who wants to kind of get yeah. together and record a little bit, let yeah. me know. I think I'm, I'm going to Jamaica early next year. So, wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't don't know if we have any listeners from Jamaica, <laughs> but if we do, hey, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Hi, my name is Jade. I'm from England. I listen to your podcast on my one hour stroll into work, then back. I have a theory, but I'm unsure if you've spoken about it. I'm sure as you've pretty much covered all bases so far. Um, so Jamie is on his way to Winterfell, where I think he will join with John. This is show. Uh, yep. Kind of base uh, where I think you will join a giant in fighting the big fight with the whites. I believe Jamie will die a valiant death. Arya will steal his face, go to King's Landing, kill Cersei as Jamie, which technically would fulfill the Valonqar prophecy. What do you think? And then she kind of adds on here. Um, I'm going for my previous email, listening to your recent podcast about Azor High or the princess or prince that was promised. Could it be Bran of Tarth? Could Bran of Tarth be the one to kill Jamie um, and use Oathkeeper to be Lightbringer? Then Arya takes Jamie's face same thing right god i just love game of thrones yeah (laughs) yeah so do we yes same lady jade um you know i think the piece where she says um so it's yeah the jamie well and inserting you know um brienne of tarth yeah you know killing jamie um you know a lion and her love that's Mm -hmm. interesting it's an interesting twist it wouldn't necessarily then be him that would go kill cersei but as she says Arya would take um you know take Jamie's face and go, which one do you prefer? Which one do you think it's, you know, more likely to be? Is it just Jamie himself that go, that that would go and kill his sister or would it be Arya ticking someone off of her list, but wearing Jamie's face? Pretty cool. Actually. Yeah. I hope not. I'm actually starting to come up with my own idea about Jamie uh, that I kind of told you. You were like, Whoa. And I'm I'm still, I haven't figured it all out yet, but it's, 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 uh, it's something I kind of want to save for a bit. But I guess I, I am more in the idea, I guess, I, to me, I think it would be cool. There is going to be that Jamie Brienne thing. And I don't know how it's going to yeah how it's going to factor in. Um, we actually had a little further. Um, we were talking a little bit further. I just didn't put it in here. Uh, but we were talking specifically about if it was Oathkeeper to be Lightbringer, which would be kind of cool because Oathkeeper was forged from ice. Yeah. And it was ice yeah. was destroyed with fire, mm-hmm. right. right? And it's forged into two different swords. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So yep. uh, could be kind of cool. We then 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 at one point we said something about like we should just go help Gur right wins a winner. I said yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> so much. Would love yeah. to, but yeah. So <laughs> I I do think there is going to be something to do with um, with Oathkeeper. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. I I think Jamie is. As you said, um, more significant. There's something else, you know. That that there's. I don't think he's going. I don't think some, anyone's going to wear his face. I think that's giving Arya too much. We've already seen that she doesn't get to tick off everybody on her list, you know. Yeah. And actually, if anyone needed to tick, I mean, that would be Sansa. I would give that. I would give that, um, you know, showdown yeah. to Sansa in some, you know, using as you said last week, what Cersei has taught her to kind of overthrow. Cersei. Yeah. There's so many different possibilities yeah. that you could go with. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, but, I'm gonna toss something out here that I was actually thinking about throwing in, which is my own theory. Okay, this is remember when yesterday when I said, yep, "Hey, I got my I own do. theory here." Is it possible? Hear me out. That Cersei is Azor High, and hear me out. Uh, <laughs> in that she like, she does kind of fulfill say the Mad King thing. 
uh-huh. where except she she kills the Night King with wildfire, blows up King's Landing, like sacrifices herself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to blow up King's Landing. And maybe she does it in order to somehow like save Jamie or, or something. You know what I mean? Well, wouldn't it be something? I mean, interesting on that, by the way, as you can clearly see, all theories are safe on Fallout Friday. Oh, yeah. You just throw them all out. <laughs> just throw them all out there. You know, but, uh, okay, think about this. If if Cersei, I, I would, I actually, whether it's her with her dying breath or, or at the last moment, you know when someone, that look in their eye where they're like, it's almost like they've like a sickness has consumed them and they've just been mm-hmm. heartbroken or, or just in living in misery or whatever. And then at the end, right at the end, it's bittersweet right. kind of, right? But then they realize how much they she loves Jamie and then she's she's pushed him away or whatever but then she kind of comes back right. at that last second you know right. yeah. um a, a, a slight little redeeming thing and it yeah. could be something like saving everyone in King's Landing yeah. where she was willing to destroy right. all of them before and you know the, you know the funny thing is it seems like everyone has just because Tyrion seems so obvious yeah and that's who she's worried about it's going to be the entire time mm-hmm. she's worried it's going to be Tyrion cuz he is still little brother yeah yeah um it's going to be Tyrion that kills her off that everyone has just assumed it's Jamie. The yeah. guy seems too obvious. Yeah. Like, yeah. And so everyone's like, it's going to be Jamie. <clears throat> okay. Here's a question for you. Uh, talking about Cersei, you know, it starts off. Jamie is just a jerk. Yeah. Uh, Jamie and Cersei both are kind of like, they're a bunch of whatever blah, blah, blah. And then once even, you know, there's, there's subtle hinting that Jamie, there's more to his story than meets the eye, but we still overwhelmingly just sort of like an ass, you right. know, but then once his hand is taken from him, these truths come out and, all, mm-hmm. and with with one swing of the sword we're like we are behind him we're like oh my gosh this yeah. guy is there's something here you know that's never happened really with Cersei has yeah. it where, where all of a sudden as readers we've kind of no said, I would say I would say there is um and I think I, it is and I would say is it, it's a storm of swords where you start getting the Cersei chapters and it's after Tywin's dead and you start to see you get like the Maggie the frog thing and I think you get to start to see into her insight and then even in the show Mm-hmm. Um, I was kind of starting to root for Cersei once she gets kidnapped. Oh, there you go. Once she gets taken or, by yeah, the Sparrow. Or, or arrested. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is when you kind of when you kind of get to see it. Um but I think it's it is better in the books because yeah. Yeah. um when she's kind of ruling uh, uh uh she's kind of having these interactions with Tommen mm-hmm. and she's really you really get to see that she's kind of doing it because she really does love her kids. Mm-hmm. That is ultimately yep. her driving force is her family. Yep. Um, and I'm actually really starting to just like Cersei more as as a character. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Be- because, and I'll say this, is that Cersei, like, when you look at every, every, every character, you kind of get, um, Gur says he writes great characters. You get this, like, what holds them back? Jon's a bastard. Tyrion's a dwarf. Jaime loses his hand. He's also, like, in the Kingsguard. So nobody can ever really fulfill all they want to fulfill. And Cersei... Her entire thing is that she should be like she wants to be. She's like, I should be the heir to Casterly Rock. Mm -hmm. She's ultimately held back because she is a woman living in this society. She actually would. If she were a male, she would be major player. She is already. But, you know, I mean, she is. And that's ultimately what holds her back is that she like is the smartest and she is like the best schemer. Well, and she has those ambitions that Jamie doesn't have that she doesn't have. And in the show, you get to see it where she. Um, t- talks to Tywin and, and she's like, I should be there. Like that isn't in the books, but it's still, it's great. It's yeah. another great thing. And, and that she's ultimately held back because she's a woman living in, you know, medieval society where women have no rights. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. But. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I was again, so talking about Gurr's interview, he talks about that. Actually. Yeah, he does. Yeah. That's actually why he kind of, you know, people have, there's been some people who try to like criticize him a little bit. Cause like this treatment of women and, and, and this series, he's like, I'm like, this is all driven from history. You know, he's, yeah. he's been very open about, you know, um, you know, how, where he, where he kind of pulls as Regine's going to highlight later, the war of roses and things that we're going to talk about. Yeah. You know, there's a lot there that, uh, that he pulled from history and it's unfortunate, but that's where it kind of came from. So, yeah. you know, but, but it's neat because like we, we do see, you know, people like Brienne of Tarth, you know, and, and Cersei is, then does become, in the show at least, she is then queen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and, well, and even things, Daenerys. So. Daenerys. Yeah, is, Daenerys, exactly. You know, yeah. yeah. Daenerys, everything Daenerys has to come over because she's a woman. And also, think about this. This is just something interesting is like, we it really, it's really felt like these past couple of years, especially with like superhero movies and stuff like that, where we're really, okay, we're finally starting to get like good, strong female characters mm-hmm. and things, even television shows and stuff like that. But girl was writing this in like the 90s. Oh, I know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. 
Yep. You know, so. Yep. Well, even in his line of kings and things that he had drawn up in his mind, you know, um, he had he had famous, you know, women and rulers and things, yeah. you know, as a part of it. Not even Arya. Arya. I mean, Arya, people love Arya. Oh, I love, yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So. Okay, uh, Lady Jade, thank you very much. Look forward to uh, hearing from you again. Um, all right, yeah. Sir Matt. Uh, trivia time. All right, so uh, trivia question here. What is Marjorie Tyrell accused of using that leads to her arrest? Yeah. Hey, I'm kind of proud of myself. I mean, I didn't get the... I, I, I got this one, sort of. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. You know? You didn't, yeah. You, I thought it out you, loud. Yeah, and you, then I, you you knew like kind of what it was, but you just had a yeah. the name is like there's a specific there's name. a very specific name. Yeah. So uh, please please try to include that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I, I want I want the specific name. Um, I guess I'll even give a hint. Kind of this year, it's, it's uh, Grand Maester Paisalu kind of confirms that she's using this, mm-hmm. and that's ultimate. It, it's she's accused of doing something, but this is kind of the solidifier. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Yep. All right here. Let's move on to Lady uh, Kelly uh, Marino here. Hey, Sir Ezra, the Watchful, and Sir Matt, the Bud Knight. First off, I would like to say that your podcast is amazing. Thank you for all of the fascinating history and book discussion breakdown for the first time readers like me. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you, Lady Kelly. Seriously, anytime we get comments like that. We got a review on iTunes the other day. Like I was, Ezra, Sir Ezra and I were like in tears. It was amazing. Yeah, I just, we'll, we'll reference it. Uh, yeah, I'll yeah, pull it up. At the end yeah. here. Um, just a thought while I had watching a recent interview with Amelia Clark, I noticed her short blonde hairstyle at first. I thought she must be trying to embrace her character for the final season, but after second thought, uh, what if she dyed her hair and cut it short because she was defeated in battle and didn't want to wear a wig. The Dothraki cut their braids when defeated in battle. And she is a great Khaleesi after all. Would love to know your thoughts on this. That's interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so Gosh, in this season, then that would mean she's defeated because they just in they Westeros. like just they just finished filming. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. But that would mean she's she's defeated somewhere in, in Westeros in, in a major battle, but doesn't die. Doesn't die. Uh huh. And cuts her braid. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that's not uh, defeated in the uh, in the war to went to to end all wars there. You know. But that would be interesting. Uh, that would be a cool thing because that means she would somehow lose but still live. Right, because yeah. I think if you just assume she would lose, she would die. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Jon Snow dies, and maybe she wins the whole thing, but she realizes that what it took her to win, like she lost more than you know, she lost her children. She maybe she loses all of her dragons and say Jon Snow. Yeah, um, but maybe let's say she's pregnant, so you know, still kind of like a bittersweet ending, and so she decides to cut her hair because she is a Khaleesi after all, and she's yeah, that's like, interesting. She, and she and it's more of like a self kind of a thing she's like i got everything i wanted i got the throne i've been seeking but to do it i lost so much like she thinks back maybe to dario nahara she lost her brother i mean he was a dick but she lost her brother she lost cal drogo that would be kind of cool mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it could also simply be hollywood well yeah for sure yeah. and I, I was trying to think of you know uh daenerys which type of queen is she really trying to embrace is she trying to become you know like is she stay under that khaleesi type of she, she's such an interesting she has a mix of so much uh, yeah of so many different uh backgrounds and her path to power right. you know um maybe that's what she views is she's maybe like unlike Aegon who come Aegon the conqueror who comes and tries to embrace that she's like no i want to break the wheel i'm just going to do things my way yeah and you know something um that that i think it's uh quaith kind of talks about you know is always trying to tell her that she needs to what is it she needs to go east to, to go west north mm-hmm. to go south you know, that she needs to go back to go forward. And it's almost like she needs to go as far back to her roots, to her heritage, you know, as far back as, as to, you know, Dragonstone and mm-hmm. Fire and Blood. Because mm-hmm. along the way, she's, she's turned into Khaleesi. And then she goes to Marine and, and Yunkai. Mm-hmm. And when she's there, she adopts their ways. She lets the, she's against, sli- uh, you know, slavery, but... Uh, she lets them, you know, put people in the pits, the, 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 the fighting, you know, go right. on there. She doesn't want her dragons really chained up, but she allows it to be. She she's becomes a peacemaker versus of just ruling with fire and blood. So I've kind of wondered, you know, what does she uh, ultimately, I think, to win Westeros and to be who she needs to be, she has to, as, as Quaith says, she has to go back to go forward. Yeah. So she's going to have to undo these things. That's really what's happening to her in A Dance of Dragons at the end. She has this... Um, 
Oh, she eats berries. She's got uh, she almost has like dysentery and things mm-hmm. going on. I mean, she's out there with her dragon uh, eating raw meats and crazy mm-hmm. stuff, you know, when he's there. And that's right before um, the Kalasar shows up or whatever. And, and she's kind of rescued and saved by them, which is full circle type right. of thing. Um, but she has to decide at that point to come back. And I think they did this in the show. She comes back and it's just, no, it's fire and blood time. You know, it's just time to kind of yeah. reign and rule. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know if she would be that type of, if she's really holding to her Dothraki ways, you know, anymore. So I don't know. It's a really good question though. Yeah. Lady Kelly, uh, Lady Kelly, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lady yeah. Kelly. All right. Cool All beans. right. Here we go. Here, uh, Regine, um, yes. whose name we're never gonna, last name we're never going to try and pronounce ever again. Uh, <laughs> greetings, guys. I am sorry I have not written to you in a while, but life has been busy with exams and my teaching job. But now I am on summer vacation, and I am currently sitting in a cafe in Oslo, nice, um, where I am visiting my friend. Thanks, uh, Lily Hammer. Okay, Old yeah, ne- Netflix show. Yeah, it's and, and how I know some some Norwegian places. And okay, but I think it, it's like a big city there. That's what, where you would fly into if you're going to fly there. Maybe the capital. I don't know. We should go visit. Yeah, I'd be down. Uh, it's you know, yeah. The Winter Olympics were there one year. Anyway, um, I would like to continue sending, continue sending you history parallels that I and other people have found in the books. I've also decided uh, what my research question for my master's thesis will be, and I've been assigned a supervisor. My theme is fictionalization, mainly mainly how the French uh, philosopher, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. Paul Ricoeur. I don't speak French. Uh-huh. Um, thinks about uh, fictionalization of a history in a narrative. My research will be to find parallels in the Song of Ice and Fire books with our own history and discuss what function this has in Gurr's narrative. I will indeed, uh, it will indeed be a challenge, but I'm looking forward to getting started and, of course, send you, you guys materials for the podcast where hopefully people can listen and send in their own thoughts and parallels, which could be useful for my paper. Yeah, yeah. Last time I wrote to you uh, as it was a uh, very brief introduction to how Gurr has been inspired by the history, uh, what he's been inspired by in the history of Song of Ice Fire. I mentioned the connection between the War of the Roses, Westeros, and England, King's Landing, and London, and Cersei, uh, and Margaret of Anjou. Uh, going with that? Yeah. Uh, this time I have uh, some interesting stuff for you. The term power is an important word in Westeros, just as it was in the period of the War of the Roses in England, uh, about 1450 to 1485, for those who have forgotten already. Power was rather simple. Basically, the one who sat on the throne owned it, no matter how that person um, was, like uh, p- uh, personality-wise. The only antidote for this dangerous use of power was for others to swear loyalty to the throne, the ones who did not usually get arrested and executed for treason. We find a similar situation and environment in the Game of Thrones series. We witness House Stark, who is loyal to the Baratheon regime while Robert is still king. Uh, The loyalty bursts when Joffrey takes the throne and Ned Stark finds out he is not uh, a rightful heir to the throne. There is no secret that Joffrey is an immature brat king who abuses his power. The minute Ned Stark challenges the loyalty to the crown, he is accused of treason and gets executed. So this shows us basically how powerful the one and only king was in the medieval ages in England. Um, another cool uh, character parallel is King Edward IV of House York and Rob Stark. Edward was the first king from House York during the War of the Roses, and he was an, uh, an extremely intelligent commander in the field and an excellent war strategist. Wow. He won a great and important battle at the uh, Mortimer's Cross and secretly married Elizabeth Woodville, who did not come from a noble nor wealthy family. In Gurr's story, Rob Stark is also very talented in war context. He has a lot of allies in the north, like Edward IV. He is also appointed king, but only in the north, um, where they gather uh, to avenge the death of Ned Stark. He also wins an important battle against the Lannisters and takes Jamie Lannister prisoner. Rob also marries Jane Westerling, uh, Talisia from Volantis in the show, even though he has promised Walter Frey to marry one of his daughters. The house Westerling in the book is noble, but not wealthy. There is a difference between um, the books in the show and in the show it is more. Em- oh, sorry. You just type something or something. Um, oh God, sorry. You're moving the, moving the thing around there, sir, Ezra, by typing, uh, where was I? Uh, there's, uh, nevertheless, we see multiple clear parallels between the historic figure and the fictional character. I hope you find this as interesting as I do. And again, I really want to say how much I love your podcast. Keep up the good work. Many of my friends here in Norway have started to listen to your podcast. Uh, after you had the episode with my inputs in it, which is very cool. My mom and dad also thought it was pretty awesome. Have a great summer. I promise to update you um, 
as soon as I start working on my master's thesis. With that, I give you a quote from the departed Tim Bergling, a.k.a. Avicii, which I find fitting for the Game of Thrones universe. Uh, water is sweet, but blood is thicker. Mm. Best regards, Regine Oss. Oss, or as she says in parentheses, <laughs> you know, ass land. Okay. Yeah, I believe it is like Oss, like A-A-S, like a hoss cat. H- Hoss Oss Oslin. Yeah, you know, Sir Ezra and I. We, we, it's Oslin. I've I got think, it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a Hoss cat. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Got it. Regine, thank you. That's, that's honestly really cool. You know, I. Um, she's totally right. And, and I, I know other people, you know, other people knew this. I had no idea. Um, I was, when I started out reading, you know, Game of Thrones and A World of Ice and Fire, I was just reading it for the plot, the story, what, the characters, that kind of stuff. And then right. I got into the man behind it all. You know, and you start to get in. Once you do that, then you have to get into his motivations. Mm-hmm. And so we were listening to his his uh, short little podcast that he had the other day, or he's had back in the day. Um, and then, like as you said, interviews and inspirations, and uh, totally correct. And that there is a lot of references to, uh, you know, these these characters and stuff, which mm-hmm. I don't know them all, and I don't know all the histories. Um, not not even close. But it's amazing to me that that Gur is as well versed in the histories. Um, you know, at, at, he's he's a student of history. Mm-hmm. You know. So, uh, yeah, so I looked up Edward the fourth of England. Uh, that is one area where I'm just not all super familiar with history is kind of once you get past the crusades is I kind of lose just kind of track of European history. Um, what's like the Roman empire is done. Anyway, Edward the fourth, uh, was King of England from March 4th, 1461 to the third of October, 1470. So, and then again, uh, from 1471 until his death in 1483. Uh, the first half of his rule was married with violence associated with the War of Roses, but he overcame the Lancastrian, uh, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, challenge to the throne. Um, uh, before he became king, he was do uh, all this kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, actually, so he um, yeah, he's like a kind of a brilliant um, strategist, wins tons of wars. Um, and then he kind of dies uh, just... Um, when he when he dies, it's just kind of uh, he just had a bunch of ailments and mm-hmm. yeah, you know, uh, just kind of a, a things like thing like that. But um, yeah, it says he was a uh, extremely capable and daring military commander. He crushed the House Lancaster in a series of spectacular military vic- uh, victories. He was popular and very able king, despite his occasional political setbacks, um, usually from the Machiavellian rival Louis the Eleventh of France. Um, and yeah, just kind of some similarities to Rob Stark and that Rob's a pretty good military commander. Right. Um, just, mm-hmm. I don't, that is something I just find, I do just find odd is how, just how good Rob is against Tywin Lannister in terms of military strategy. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I actually think it may, um, maybe it's just the Northerners is that they're, they're fighting for a different cause. Well, it's also too, I mean, I think. Tywin's strengths, you know, he was hand of the king, right? And right. he was more of a, he's know, more of like a political strategist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. And, and like you know, g- gaining revenues and how to, how to run a kingdom, not how to win a kingdom in war. Mm-hmm. That's actually kind of always his thing. He sits on the side, sort of waiting to see how these things will play out. He is very still, you know, um, a Military, tactician. Yeah. yeah, you know, he's got that. He's got that mind. But the young wolf is also, you know, sometimes too, you get young blood in there to, to kind of like. You know, think about things differently. Try things. He's a little more riskier. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't he doesn't fall in line with the traditional way of doing things. Um, you know, and when's the last time the North really, you know, that 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 Tywin has seen them, you know, in action type of thing? I mean, it, right. Robert's Rebellion, um, the Greyjoy Rebellion, you know, stuff like that. So I don't know. It just uh, I think it's I think you, it's also if you look at say the American Civil War, um, and this may be part of it. Obviously, you're flip the sides here right Mm -hmm. um is that the south while the south was not as you know obviously didn't have the numbers that the north did Mm -hmm. the south had better military strategists yeah and the south also if you think about the people that were fighting because you're just grabbing whoever right to come fight for you yeah you have armies and men but you're just grabbing whoever and the south had more skilled people because you just you weren't in cities and things like that so you have like hunters and farmers and stuff like that. So they're just going to be quicker to right, adapt right. to the weaponry. Well, it's probably the same in the North because the North is heavily wooded and stuff like that. So 
even in like hold fast and stuff like that, the people are like hunting and things like that. Where in the South, you kind of live more in cities and things mm-hmm. like that. And so you're, you're not going to be as adept to just pick up these type of weaponry yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, that, that's a good point. It's almost like, you know, that if you're urbanized or whatever, you're in those big cities that you're kind of, you know, softer or that you're not um, not, not used to the ways of war, perhaps, or just being as hardened as, as, uh, as someone from the north. You know, even though you've got farmers and, and people who maybe hadn't held a sword, they still know those hardships or they still right. are just they've got, I don't know, they're survivors, you know, type mm-hmm. of thing. So, I don't know. It's a good point. So, um, let's see. Anything else on, on, uh, on no, regimes? That's it. That's just, again, thank you so much, uh, Regime, for sending in, like, all of the research, like, is very well put together. Yeah, it is. And I think, I think, uh, and also, know, she's I, made the connections there for us, really. Yeah. Uh, and, um, also the fact that she probably translates all of this stuff. She does translate this. Yeah. It's like very helpful because Google Huge. Translate is pretty terrible. Uh, no, she did a beautiful job. It's yeah, amazing. It's amazing, actually. Yeah. yeah. And anyone else that does that translates it into English. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's just something as Americans we don't do where we don't grow up learning multiple languages. So very unfortunate. My yeah, friend. Actually, actually is. It yeah. really is. It really, it really, it really, I know it really so, is. So. Um, but one more thing too, I want to say, so she, uh, her being from, from Norway, I actually believe my, my mom traveled to Norway as a foreign exchange student. And I'm going to figure out where she, which city she actually went to and what place she was at. I'm going to, I'm going to send, uh, regime some of that information and see just kind of figure out where that's at. I've always wanted yeah, to go Oslo back, is the actually. capital by the way. Is it the capital? Okay. Yeah, I love I love looking up other countries and just seeing like what Oh me they? too. I love yeah I think it's I think it's really neat. I've always liked that that um, that area. So mm-hmm. um, okay. All right let's move on here. Let's see we've got our humble blacksmith Caleb. Mm-hmm. Here we go. We told we said last Friday we would uh, we would save his email for this Friday and here it is. Um, my dearest goodest of lordiest lords <laughs> uh, a few episodes ago you were speaking on Arya's concern uh, being bastard born because of her resemblance to Jon Snow I'm not exactly sure what chapter it is but I distinctly remember a line stating Arya looking very much like Lyanna um, so just a hint from Gur um, about Jon's true lineage so using the, the, the transitive property this solidifies blank plus L equals J in a song of ice and fire for me. So basically saying, you know what he's saying there is that like, does it matter who you put in that blank? That, that L is, 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 is definitely, you know, a part of the equation. Yeah. You know, so Liana is the mother of John, but it may not be Rhaegar. Well, it could be, I mean, it could, it, it, it could be, it could be Rhaegar. Right. I, I know what yeah. saying. But he's saying blank. So it doesn't matter who doesn't matter who, but he's just saying like, right. Like I that part you. seems pretty pretty firm to him is that it ha- that somehow it is it is it is liana yeah. you know so he goes on to say your show is awesome professional quality and incredible insights i'm a new listener as of a few months ago can't get enough your humble blacksmith caleb well thank you very much yeah caleb, caleb honestly. seriously anytime seriously guys and i mean that anytime we get positive reviews i just i'll like i'll, I'll like text as and i'll be like yeah I'm sick did you see that review yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's well it's such a good community because i mean your you, the, the email like the ravens that we get are so in depth man mm-hmm. i mean they're so um th- th- they're full of uh you can tell you guys the amount, of, re- and the amount of re- the amount of research it causes us to do like we would just do the research in general to do it but now yeah. it's it just helps because it, it just points us in the right direction because they're, they're just even with the the five just the main the five main series books we have right there's just so much yeah to cover and that doesn't even touch Duncan Egg, World of Ice and Fire, the novellas, just yeah. the show. The show also impacts yeah. potential things and just so much. That's why, that's why Fallout Friday is one of my favorites because you can go to all parts, the histories, mm-hmm. you know, speculating green dreams beyond Dance of Dragons and get into the, to the nitty gritty of it. So, um, you know, I think it's neat. I think, Caleb, that's, I, I, it is very, um, huh, yeah. So I'm going to, yeah, the, I have a passage I'm about to read about Arya and Lyanna and, um, so I'll, I'll read the ghost of Heron Hall's, you know, email Raven this week, and then tie it back into what Caleb uh, mm-hmm. has said, if that's okay. Go right ahead. I think that's okay. Okay, so let's dive into um, the, the ghost of Heron Hall has, uh, you know, sent us our our weekly correspondence here, and this is a tough one, and and it's actually there's not a lot here for me to for for me to go on, and I've had to really kind of mm-hmm. uh, dig deep, and I didn't come up with a whole lot, so I might I might have disappointed the ghost this week, but that's okay. I'm sure I'll get something else next week, or perhaps I'll get uh, you know more context or something from the ghost in the future. But mm-hmm. uh, I love the correspondence. So 
Uh, the question is, is Sir Duncan the Tall's heir at the wall? So Sir Duncan the Tall's, you know, son or offspring heir um, is his heir at the wall? Question, Sir Matt. The other question is, the old gods called to Theon specifically and helped him, and helped him gain himself. Who else have the old gods called to? Um, so interesting. We're, we've been talking about the old gods, and and uh, and we're actually I hadn't brought up Sir Duncan the Tall yet. Maybe um, perhaps Sir Matt, you can kind of look into the Theon connection. I'm about to read a little something from uh, A Dance of Dragons that might shed a little bit of light on this. Okay, let's see. So I'm in. Uh, for some reason, A Dance of Dragons brand uh, three has just been. It just it's just packed with information here, and I wanted to read a little connection that that is made here. Um, so Bran gets his first taste of like jumping in with with Brendan into the Weirwood, and he he kind of um, uh, shifts into he he jumps skin right he he leaves his body and goes into the roots of the Weirwood and kind of takes off right, and when he does that he um, he sees right away his father, um, you know back at Winterfell and and he's just shocked he's, he's he can't believe this. Um, his father's still alive. He actually comes back out, you know, telling Brendan he's alive. My my, my father's alive. He's there. He's in Winterfell. You know, and I'm 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 guessing that would make Bran say, "I've got to go see him. I've got to go back." And and Brendan tells him, "No, you know that that you saw um, the past." He explains how you know um, he talks about this river passing by and how men live in the present, but trees you know stay rooted right there and what can watch the stream go by, you know, and they can see where it came from and where where, where it went to type of thing. Um, and so then he heads back to um, this little this little alcove in the cave. This is when he's in the cave, by the way, with all of the uh, children of the forest, you know, and, and, and things. He's in there with Leaf. And um, Jojen's real upset. You know, he's not doing well. I think he's kind of suicidal almost, like he's, he's staying uh, here in this cave, and he's not going to – I think he knows he's going to die. Mira is upset. Hodor is Hodor, you know. And he goes back, though. He wants to tell Mira and Jojen – what happened? And when he gets back, they're not there, and it's a little disturbing. They're not there. They they they've gone somewhere. Um, now it's a vast, big cave. It goes on. You know, um, I think at one point they can get down to this river. Uh, it's six hundred feet below the ground. You know, so um, he actually, when he lays down, he falls asleep. And when he falls asleep again, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Um, hmm. Faster, faster. Okay. So, oops. Back up here a little bit. Okay, he is. He sees his father. This is going to be a little. This is going to be quite a bit. Is it okay, Sir Matt? If I no, just go, kinda... go right ahead here. I'm, okay. I'm reading all this stuff about Theon. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, all right. Watching the flames, Bran decided he would stay awake till till Mira came back. Jojen would be unhappy. He knew, but Mira would be glad for him, for he did not remember closing his eyes. Now I think this is just key. So I know this is a lot of reading, but I, I really want you guys to listen and pay attention because I have questions for you. You know, at the end of this. Oh, let's see. But then somehow he was back. So he did not remember closing his eyes. But then somehow he was back at Winterfell again in the godswood looking down upon his father. Lord Eddard seemed much younger this time. His hair was brown, no hint of gray in it, his head bowed. So again, he's seeing back into the past. He sees his father there. And his father says this, Let them grow up close as brothers with only love between them, he prayed. And let my lady wife find it in her heart to forgive. Father, Bran's voice was a whisper in the wind, a rustle in the leaves. Father, it's me. It's Bran. Brandon. Eddard Stark lifted his head and looked long at the weirwood, frowning. But he did not speak. And this, these are, this is italicized. And, and uh, so when I say it's italicized, it's Bran's internal thoughts. He cannot see me, Bran realized, despairing. He wanted to reach out and touch him. Uh, but all he could do was watch and listen. I'm in the tree. I'm inside the tree. I'm looking out of its red eyes, but the weirwood cannot talk, so I cannot talk. So then Eddard resumes his prayer, um, and uh, and, and kind of, and, and then all of a sudden the vision kind of, kind of, kind of fades. Uh, Ed, Eddard Stark dissolved like mist in the in the morning sun. Now, he has several visions here. He has, he has several seeings, and I, I, I'll break them down at the end here. So let's just read them though. Now, two children danced across the God's Wood, hooting at one another as they dueled with broken branches. The girl was the older and taller of the two. Arya, Bran thought eagerly as he watched her leap on, onto a rock and cut at the boy. But that couldn't be right. If the girl was Arya, the boy was Bran himself. And he had never worn his hair so long. And Arya never beat me 
playing swords the way that girl is beating him. She slashed the boy across his thigh so hard that his leg went out you know, from under him and he fell into the pool and began to splash and shout. Be quiet, stupid, the girl um, said, tossing her own um, you know, branch aside. It's just water. Do you want old Nan to hear and run and tell father? She knelt and pulled her brother from the pool, but before she got him out again, the two of them were gone. Now, mind you, I, I believe, as, as I read this, every, every vision that happens here takes place through the same werewood and in the same God's wood. It's in Winterfell. Mm-hmm. So next one. After that, the glimpses came faster and faster. Still, Bran was feeling lost and dizzy. He saw no more of his father, nor the girl who looked like Arya, but a woman heavy with child emerged naked and dripping from the black pool, knelt before the tree and begged the old gods for a son who would avenge her. Then there came a brown-haired girl, slender as a spear, who stood on the tips of her toes to kiss the lips of a young knight as tall as Hodor. The dark-eyed youth, pale and fierce, sliced three branches from a werewood and shaped them into arrows. I'm sorry, a dark-eyed youth. Uh, so not, and that's not referring to our mm-hmm. knight there. A dark-eyed youth, pale and fierce, sliced three branches off the werewood and shaped them into arrows. The tree itself was shrinking, growing smaller with each vision. Uh, so really, he, the, the tree is just getting younger, you know, and he sees other trees kind of come and go. Um, and, and so after they kind of come and go, he says, and now the lords, Bran glimpsed, um, oh, I'm sorry, back here a little bit. Uh, I want to be able to, oh no! And now the lords Bran glimpsed were tall and hard, stern men in fur and chainmail. Some wore faces he remembered from the statues in the crypts, but they were gone before he could put a name to them. Then, as he watched, a bearded man forced a captive down onto his knees before the heart tree. A white-haired woman stepped towards them through a drift of dark red leaves, bronze sickle in her hand. No, said Bran. No, don't. But they could not hear him. No more than his father had. The woman grabbed the captive by the hair, hooked the sickle around his throat, and slashed. And through the mist of centuries, the broken boy could only watch as the man's feet drummed against the earth. But as his life flowed out of him in a red tide, Brandon Stark could taste the blood. Um, so a couple of things happen there. You know, there's, um, there's a couple of different, I guess, like visions you know I, I think we see i believe we see sir duncan the tall what do mm-hmm. you think sir man i mean like that that when it makes a, a tall young yeah. knight well you know? here's the we know that so we don't know i mean we kind of know what happens with duncan the tall we know that if the, if the last thing we know of him just given by the the duncan egg series is that he is at the tourney at or where's that at uh not ashford meadow the where he's the mystery knight Anyway, he's close. He's he's close to the north, and they they because they were they were talking about potentially going up afterwards and squiring for the current Lord Stark. Okay, and after that, they kind of give a little break and say Duncan Egg's going to come back with more things. We you know he eventually will. I think they say he'll go to the Wall. He'll come back and become to Lord Commander and stuff like that. And there's theories that Bran of Tarth is a heir of. Duncan the Tall. Um, there's theories that Old Nan is, you know, Rowan Weber, mm-hmm. yeah. um, and so you know, I do like the idea that Duncan, you know, because if he is, if he is at the King's Guard at the time, that maybe that's why he can't marry them or whatever, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and so that he does still end up getting with them and having children. Children, yeah, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, that's interesting. You know, I think that the, the ghost emo is that are any of his heirs. You know, at the wall, right? And I think I think seeing him here at Winterfell and seeing him, you know, kissing whether it's Old Nan, Lady Weber, mm-hmm. you know, or someone else, and Hodor, yeah, is is Hodor, yeah, so right. And when well, we know Hodor is a is a descendant of of uh, great grandson of yeah. of Old Nan, um, and the connection as tall as Hodor, mm-hmm. right, um, makes us believe that that was. Sir Duncan the Tall, yep. there in the Godswood, you know, sneaking a kiss or whatever. Maybe they I snuck away. So. I hope so. You know, yeah. he's such a good character. He is my, my he's like my favorite. Character. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, and I mean, uh, the whole series, he he's probably even more than Jon Snow. He's yeah. probably my favorite. Yeah. The only the only thing I, I would say to the ghost is if let's say that was Old Nan that he was you know smooching on there and ends up hooking up with or whatever, would one of his heirs be at the wall? If it if you're talking about one of old you know children that he had. And descendants that he had with old Nan, she says they, they they're all lost except for yeah. Hodor, yeah. you know. And Hodor is the only her only surviving blood. Really, they yeah. were lost in the in the wars with Robert and her even her even her um, 
her daughters became wives and they right. themselves have, have she outlived them, you know? Mm-hmm. So if it's, if that is old Dan, then ah, not so sure. Now, if it was someone like, you know, how do you get to the Brienne of Tarth right. be, being a descendant? Who would it have been that he was with? Right. You know, because you got Tanzel too tall, who is another girl who he's interested in. Yeah. You know, I mean, so it's he references kinda, every time. Every yeah. Book. I just wonder if there's going to be more girls. You know what I mean? It's I just hope like, so. and he's, I, just, not, he's a good guy. He's not, you know, he's just doing his own thing or whatever. And he's just, he's, I don't know. He's, he's great. Yeah. Please read the Night of Seven Kingdoms. Please if you read it. It's all so three good. of them. They're just so good. You will understand. The audiobook is the the best. Absolutely worth getting. Yeah, absolutely worth it. I mean, as soon as you read the first Hedge Knight, you will understand why we fell in love with Hedge Knights. You will understand why we fell in love with Sir Duncan the Tall and and everything about him. It's just and it's just different. They're just and they're just short little contained stories. Yeah, and they're great. I, I love them. They be they're my favorite. To be honest, they're like I like them more than yeah. Oh the yeah. Main series. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're wonderful. Now, a couple um, theory. I'll throw out a few thoughts here, and I, I want to go over these again. Some some things that Bran saw in that. Um, yeah, because I have the in, the, uh, I have the Theon stuff. Okay, too, okay. Yeah. In that vision, and this is um, so. So to answer Ghost, uh, you know, hit, um, the thought there. I there could be there, there definitely could yeah. be someone there at the wall. We've even speculated that perhaps Dun- Sir Duncan at one point, you know, if something went down at at um, at Summerhall. You know, after that, and maybe Egg had to, if if Egg did live and had to go across the narrow sea, he would probably go with him. But maybe if he didn't, you know, uh, maybe they had to split, you know, ways. And he and he mm-hmm. did end up going to the Night's Watch or whatever and went through Winterfell. So there's a possibility there. But the things that Bran sees during his sleep, you know, the, the visions uh, through the Winterfell heart tree. He sees his young father praying, you know, let them grow to be closest brothers uh, with only love between them. Let my lady, uh, my lady wife uh, find it in her heart to forgive. He sees a young girl and a younger boy uh, play fighting with branches. I think uh, someone had said, I think it was Caleb had just mentioned, Arya looks a lot like Lyanna. Bran actually mistakes Arya for Lyanna. It's actually mm-hmm. Lyanna um, and um, Benjen. You know, and so that's actually, you know, I, th- I believe Liana and Benjen fighting each other, um, and it just shows you what a, you know, what a badass Liana is. She's whooping up on her younger brother, and uh, but she looks just like Arya, but he knows that's not Arya, and his hair wasn't that long, and you know, and and, and things. So um, that's a neat little connection there. And then he sees a pregnant woman coming out of the black pool, praying for a son to avenge her. I saw a lot of different theories on this, you know, as to who that could be. Um, you know, it being, uh, I think at one point one of the well, uh, Lords of Winterfell had to fight a king beyond the wall, and there was a whole whole piece where the the son that this that this lady has actually ends up going and fighting and killing his father, who might have raped the the mother type of situation. So uh, that could be that. There could be something else. A slender girl on her toes kisses a knight as tall as Hodor. I believe that that is Sir Duncan the Tall. I don't know who the girl is though, and I right. would love to hear people speculate on that. Um, a pale, dark-eyed youth cutting three branches from the weirwood and shaping them into arrows. Full credit here goes to the Citadel, Westeros.org. You should check it out. Um, they totally believe that this is, you know, Torin uh, Stark, the king who knelt, um, had a brother, Brandon Snow. And Brandon Snow said that he could kill Aegon's right. dragons during Aegon's conquest. So instead of kneeling, uh, it was almost like he had cut mm-hmm. perhaps these... He had a werewood bow and perhaps werewood arrows. Thought maybe arrows, they could kill dragons. Thought they could kill dragons. And so there's there's the idea that maybe maybe there is something to that, you know? Mm-hmm. So something to keep your eye on. Could, could and isn't it interesting that the, that Bran's visions cause him to see other brands? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yep. That's, that's a big theory is that they're all the same person, right? Yep, like, yeah, it is. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, and then he saw other lords of Winterfell, Tarl, Dark, Stern. Those are just old, you know, lords of Winterfell. And then now, the bearded man forcing uh, a captive down on his knees and a white-haired woman killing the captain, uh, captive with a bronze sickle. White-haired. I don't know if that means old mm-hmm. or if that means, like, would that be misinterpreted to be, like, silver hair? Or would that be, perhaps, you think of the, the, the Night King who was fell in love with a female version of like an other, the cold lady, you know, who could have had, you know, kind of whiter hair perhaps. So uh, just some thoughts, something to, to, for you guys to think about. Again, just go check out, you know, um, brand three and, and, in a dance of dragons and, and see what you think, open up your book and, 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 and check it out. So yeah. um, what, what are your thoughts on Theon there? Uh, all right. Cause he asked about Theon and the old gods and how he could have um, 
let me pull up his exact question here. Uh, the old gods called to Theon specifically and helped him gain himself. What else have you? Who else have the old gods called to? Um, so here, let me pull this up. Uh, full credit goes here to um, F. Yeah, I'm curious. Tumblr, <laughs> somebody's Tumblr. It's like a, it's like he, does, he runs like a Game of Thrones Tumblr, Song of Ice and Fire. All right. Tell me, anyways, he just has this pulled up here. The end and the old gods. Uh, we all know that in the previous life of Stark's ward or Prince of Winterfell, Theon seldom prayed at all, and Stark tree gods meant nothing to him. This is a section from A Clash of Kings. Tell me true, nephew, do you pray to the wolf gods now? Theon seldom prayed at all, but um, but that was not something you confessed to a priest, even your father's own brother. Ned Stark prayed to a tree. No, I care for nothing for Stark gods. Clash mm-hmm. of Kings. That's when he gets off on Pike and his uh, sure. uncle comes to greet him. Who I can't remember. What's, his, what's that guy's name? Uh, oh, uh, Aaron. 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 Granger. Aaron Granger, yeah. Yep. Um, so then he goes on to then um, this person goes on to say, but yeah, uh, but when he's back um, to half ruined Winterfell as a human ruin named Reek, the situation suddenly changes during his first visit to the um, good old Godswood where he had uh, to give away Ramsay's bride. Mm-hmm. This is from A Dance of Dragons. It's like one of the Reek chapters. Yep. Theon found himself wondering if he should say a prayer. Will the old gods hear me now if I do? They were not his gods, never had been his gods. He was an ironborn, a son of Pike. His god was the drowned god of the islands. But Winterfell was long leagues from the sea. It had been a lifetime since um, any god had heard him. But he did not know who he was or what he was, why he was still alive, why he had ever been born. Theon, a voice seemed to whisper. His head snapped up. Who said that? All he could see were the trees and the fog that covered them. The voice had been as faint as rustling leaves, as cold as hate. A god's voice or a ghost's. Uh, How many died that day he took Winterfell? How many uh, more took that day he lost it? The day Mm -hmm. that Theon died and reborn as Reek. Yeah. Um, Then he goes on to say that the person, uh, he's not just praying, he communicates with the god and he's willing thus to uh, see if they can hear his answer. Somewhere in the god's foot, a raven screamed. A dagger was still in his hand. He sheathed it. Reek is my name. Reek. It rhymes with weak. Reek bent uh, to his task. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But here's the question. Actually, some of that may be from, and then in the sample chapter of Winds of Winter, Mm -hmm. um, Asha and Yara in the show, but that doesn't happen in the show, um, asks Stannis, because Stannis is going to kill him, um, to behead him in front of a god's tree and don't let him be burned to R'hllor. That he should be... be, um, Really? Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Thanks, Wiki. Uh, Because I have have not read the sample chapters of Winds... Yeah, uh, I've just heard a couple that I haven't either. Has, has read, um, but I don't actually think that's the gods. Uh huh. Yeah. If he's in front of a weirwood tree, right? I think it is Bran, yeah. aka Three Eyed Crow. Okay. Yeah. Same kind of thing with Ned. What? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely within the power of the weirwood network. Yes. Yes, it is. It is. It is for sure. Yeah. So now the question is, you know, who else have the old gods called to? And I, you'd probably have to do some research to see other situations where people thought their name was called or someone was calling out to them or, you know, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think here. You know what I'm saying? I, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head, but um, I'm sure that that happens. Yeah. That's, that's the influence there, right? You know, is, is that there, it's, it kind of brings reek back to himself he's struggling with the idea that he wants to you know do some good here um even though it is just i think it's jane i think it's jane Poole um who is posing as Arya stark you know but he wants to save her he wants to do some good he sees her you know extremely mistreated uh and, and things so you know so yeah there's there's that whole piece but i don't know man um that's a really good question do you have any other any ideas on who else the 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 werewoods could be talking to besides like Ned? The which, actual which I just, werewoods say the just the old gods in general speaking. I don't know that we really ever see any god other than perhaps R'hllor kind of speak to people, and we only see them kind of I guess speak to them, or maybe they just look into the flames, and because they're looking in the flames, he decides to show them something. Right. Well, I mean, I I. Do. I think it's it's more subtle with the old gods, and I think that's yeah. the, the whole piece is like to look for things where. Um, so, so, okay, the, the title to, to Ghost of Heron Halsey, uh, you know, Raven was they whispered Theon, not Reek. Okay, so so there's there's your clue, right? Is that it's um, almost like calling him back to himself, right? Type of thing, reminding him who he was, type of thing. So, anyways, 
Um, is there a, is or there brand situation? knows him as Theon. Exactly, or Bran yeah. knows him as Theon. Yeah, but I'm thinking of like Sansa when she's in different places. You know, I, I do the gods speak to her and give her encouragement. You know, to kind of move on. Think of everybody who's ever been in front of a weirwood or walked by a weirwood. You know, and is there something that was said, or did they hear something, or was there a rustling of the leaves? That's a big indicator that that someone is trying to speak. That Bran. Um, Brendan, yeah, yeah Brendan Rivers tells him, you know, no, all, all it came through was um, when you, he's like, well, I spoke to my father. No, no, no. What he heard was a rustling in the leaves and a wind blowing and a stirring. He looks up and he thinks, and, and, and as I just read, yeah. Ned looked up and stared at the tree and kind of frowned or whatever, you know, as if, and, and, and they do sometimes think that the gods are answering them and that they're talking back to them through mm-hmm. that rustling of the leaves. You know, and it's almost like you can imagine a young brand on the other side of that, you know, calling out to people trying to help and trying yeah. to speak out. And he really can he or can he not from well, what we here's know. A, here's a question. Because Theon says he heard. Yeah, he heard the, as you just read there. You know, he, it seemed like someone had called his name. Yeah. But then so when he calls out to his father, does his father hear the rustling of the leaves or does he actually hear his, you know, a, a young boy calling out father? Yeah. Because so, Brendan just tells, as you've said, well, Brendan's powers might be capped and, and limited, and yeah, maybe Bran can do more than maybe Bran can do more. And so here, so here's the question: Is oh god, here comes here comes a handful of questions here. One, um, is it really that the three eyed crow uh, is like the aspect of all the old gods, and like that's what they're trying to do? They're trying to speak to people throughout time because if we, if you go back in a world of ice and fire, when it's talking about Bran, uh, like the pact. Right, and it talks about how Bran the Builder went and met with the children mm-hmm. to talk yeah. about things, and it said that the, he kind of learned their song, and their song was like the sounds of leaves yep. and stuff like that. Yes. Um, but then when yes, you're right. Um, so maybe that the children have also evolved over time because the children seem to know English or common. I mean, uh-huh. when Bran shows up, yeah, they they can speak his language. Yeah. Leaf is like the only one who can actually like, can, yeah. can, can speak the common tongue, you know, and the other ones down there cannot yeah. necessarily, at least we don't know. We haven't met all of them, but the ones that Mira names can't really speak. Um, so Leaf can, but you're right about something that they, that their, their speak and their speech and their, even their songs sounds like the bubbling of a river right. or a stream, the rustling of leaves, you know, um, the perhaps the cawing of a crow. And I, was about to, I was about to bring that up too. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and stuff like that. Like that comes into what we've been talking about this whole episode, and for the past <clears> couple <throat> of weeks, it seems like is if you consider the three eyed crow, say it's it's like its own entity. It has to use people, kind of a thing. If that is then a god of the weirwoods, yeah, or maybe it's just the voice of the weirwoods. Mm-hmm. So if you consider that a god. Um, then gosh, that opens the door to all kinds of things because then if it does control, say go like ghost, when mm-hmm. ghost is off doing the thing, leads John to the dragon glass pit or gets beyond the wall or, you know, gets, or, it, or does control Mormont's crow, mm-hmm. yeah. um, King, King, all that kind of stuff. Well, then there you go with the old gods talking. Yep. And it could just be the old gods, not blood Raven. Could be the old gods playing their own thing. Maybe not the three eyed crow. We think sometimes it's the three eyed crow, but mm-hmm. it could just be the old gods in general. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Maneuvering things around. Yeah, interesting. Interesting that <clears throat> because real quick. Yeah. Because when because um, Melisandre talks about like all fire, it's, yeah. she she seems to make it seem like any kind of light or any kinds of fire is basically controlled by Relore. Yeah. Because when Varus is talking about when he looked into the flames, mm-hmm. right? Like yep. the magician that took his manhood. Uh-huh. Yep. He saw something. Right. Right. And so like, he, I don't think he was a red priest. Right. You know? No, no. And yeah, then, yeah. yeah, stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Here's a question. When, um, okay. Green dreams that come to people. Yeah. You know, you look, look, look back at the Duncan egg series. And they had green dreams. Did the three eyed crow appear to, you know, what was it? Eggs, uh, you know, brother who was always in his cups and stuff like that. Maybe. Was there? We don't really, we don't know. They, they, they don't say. But I guess my question is, you know, why is it that Brendan Rivers appears as a three eyed crow? You know? Yeah. Why a three eyed crow? Is 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 my question? Why not just? 
him, uh, right, him himself. Thing. Why specifically that that animal? What, yeah, what, what, why why a three eyed crow and why? I don't know. Uh, it just it's just always kind of baffled me because he was a green seer before he ever went up there. Right, and I don't think that Brendan Rivers worshipped the old gods. Do you? Well, we I don't mean, really know what the Targaryens. I mean, the Targaryens. Well, he was a Targaryen, of, but he's also uh, his mom Blackwood, Blackwood which mm-hmm. is nor northern. Right, kind of thing. so he maybe worship both. But even look at also, his, the, he, and he was, and he be, he was like super into sorcery. And, right, but even yeah. look at his nephew and the other Targaryens who have these dreams that had what right. they called kind of green dreams, right? Because um, uh, Egg's brother, I'm not lost for his name right now. The one that was he was on the way to the tourney. Darren, um, is it is it Darren? I think it's Darren. I yeah. Think it is. yeah, it's not Arion no, who Arian was crazy. Flame, yeah. yeah. Um, so you're probably right, but he was having green dreams. He could foresee dreams. His dreams always came true the same way that Jojen's come true. Jojen just keeps saying, oh, my dreams always come true, you know? Um, but what was special in Jojen's most recent dream is that he's visited by a three eyed crow and is the three eyed crow, um, a representation of, is that how Brenda Rivers yeah. is choosing to appear in dreams or is that something else? You know, type of thing. Yeah, so. it is. Uh, yeah, it is. Darren, Darren the drunken, Darren the drunken. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but uh, anyways, you know, food for thought. So, lots of different things there this week. I think we've we went a little long. Uh, uh, yeah, we're about it. We're we're coming in on our two hour mark. Coming in Follow on two Friday. Hours. That's if we can keep it to about two hours. I think exactly. that's. I think that's 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 good. We're gonna get to the point, and we have we had we had some more ravens. We're gonna get to the point to where eventually we just uh, can't cover all the ravens, which is unfortunate. So we may well, have to just, we'll have just we'll have a we'll have a never ending supply of which of is great. Ravens. Oh, yeah. it's great. Yeah, just well, uh, <clears throat> what's neat is like this week we had three ravens, maybe four that kind of kind of talked about the three eyed crow, and so we want to lump those together. We could read all those together and yeah. then do one big discussion. It seems about like them. just in the past couple of weeks, what's happened is. Uh, is like we get kind of get going on a thread. Like we're gonna talk about the hammer for a while, you know. Yeah. Like, and then it's like okay, then or we or the main chapter kind of influences something because we were talking about Arthur Dane there for a while. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So maybe what we'll do if we go forward, if we start getting like sixteen, twenty ravens, and we just can't get to them all, we'll we'll kind of say like, hey, we'll do a poll. Here's what we're kind of thinking about. Maybe kind of tailor ravens towards this to discuss specific parts of it. So then we can kind of research a little bit more about it, and then we can kind of come in and do like a big block theory and yeah. people will have different kind of questions. Well, yeah, for sure. And I, and also we don't want to limit you because if somebody comes out with a random something that we're not, that's amazing. Of, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's the, the better the Raven and the more thought out it is and the more yeah. that, that there's there. I mean, uh, it's meat for the show and we just mm-hmm. kind of can, can take off. So, um, uh, that's what we, when we set out to, to create this group and this community and things, yeah. uh, it was all about you guys having an influence and a voice on the show because, you know, uh, we just kind of facilitate it. So when you bring these comments in, it's it's su- such a great thing. Uh, it will be neat when we start the group to kind of get people um, sharing back and forth. And as you have conversation with each other, because right now you're just sending us a raven. The whole point of that group is, you know, we can then have conversations with each other. We, Sir Matt and I can watch the conversation, jump in on the conversation, and it really makes, well, we'll pull all of that into Fallout Friday. Right, like right now we had, we posted the hound with a cocaine goal. Clegane Bowl yeah. thing, and um, somebody had said something about um, the mountain might actually still end up killing the hound just because of the way the show is. And yeah. I think her name was Winona Moon. I want to say if I'm, I can't remember her uh, name, but she had sent us a raven about that, and yes. she comments and she was like, "That's what I'm saying." So you know, like, yes. yeah. So it's just kind of cool, people. Absolutely, people yeah. going back and forth. So yeah. Uh, um, one more thing I wanted to read here. We got. Our, I, I want to read. I want to read that review that guy sent. That's us. what I was going to pull up. Read oh, okay. Oh, okay. Go for it. Go ahead. This is from Tanner RL. He, he left us a uh, review on iTunes. So uh, I just want to give him a shout out because literally Sir Ezra and I read this the other day and we were just, it was awesome. Yeah. And so uh, anytime I can read a great review about myself. I, <laughs> I was good. But anyway, I've been listening to podcasts religiously for over two years now, and this is the first podcast I've decided to write a review for. On the way to work each morning, I think, wow, if only I could break both of my arms so I no longer have to punch (laughs) numbers in a cubicle all day. Then I remember I have Bend the Knee. Bend the Knee is the type of podcast that causes both your jaw to drop and your eyes to water. I will forever remember listening to Sir Ezra the Watchful recalling Lyanna Stark's powerful scene. Promise me, Ned. Promise me. I had just finished rec- uh, uh, reconciling an entire trial balance at work, uh, yet I was in tears. <laughs> Sir Ezra and Sir Matt are absolutely incredible when it comes to describing moments in A Song of Ice and Fire. You truly believe you are in the room with them, watching these scenes from 
the perspective of the three-eyed raven mm -hmm. uh to top it off they're very humble these gentlemen appreciate their listeners more than any other podcaster i have ever listened to likewise they never forget to plug any of their fans friends who provide to the show with theories and insight as a result fans like myself are as loyal um, as they are to are just as loyal as they are to us. I just finished subscribing to all their social media outlets simply because I do not want to join the community. I want, uh, I do want to join the community. They continue to describe. Thanks y'all all the way from Texas. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so very much, so much Tanner. That honestly means a lot. It was, uh, you know, it, it does take a little extra effort to go over and leave a review. And I'm in the same boat sometimes, you know, where I've come across a podcast, uh, cause that's, that's what we do. We we, yeah. we podcast and we listen to podcasts. And um, you know, when you really find something that's that's you know, I don't know, that's a good community and there's a lot of positivity and there's a lot of reward in it. I think it's you know that's why I what well, I was a podcast listener, you know, and, and I run I run book clubs at school and I do different things like that and so I was kinda like that's what I wanted, you know, this to be and Sir Matt and I talked and it's all about community and stuff. Um, you know, the idea that when we get off of here, we talk about, we'll get probably a couple more comments and we'll talk about people from around the world, mm -hmm. which is just radical. It's, it's absolutely crazy. So, and especially the people that comment a lot, like Sir Ezra and I, when we just like talk like throughout the week, like we reference them just as like, Oh, did you see what this guy said? Did you see what this guy said? Oh, you it's like what, you see what, she, what daily she said? part of our yeah. lives. Yeah. So it's especially it's so cool. and it, and it, it does, it absolutely influences the show. Sometimes I feel nervous, honestly, when I look at like, cause the show is growing and it's doing, it's doing well. <laughs> Sometimes I get really nervous. Uh, it's like somebody compared us at one point to uh, alt shift X. And I was like, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, like <laughs> well, the, the, the cool part is I think, you know, all of you guys are willing to do the read and the research and, yeah. and, and you watch the show. Avidly you guys do and, the amount of work you guys do for us. It's insane. It's huge. It's insane. Um, so, you know, another thing I want to mention, um, speaking about just how the podcast is growing, Sir Matt was mentioning, you know, uh, one of the things that we would like to do uh, around us, we have Cincinnati, um, you know, Comic-Con coming up. And mm -hmm. I think we might try to swing down there and uh, perhaps get, uh, oh, I forget his name, Nick, Nick oh, Nicholas, the guy crazy. who plays like uh, some crazy last name. The guy who plays Jamie, Jamie Lannister, Lannister yeah. is, is coming to town and we might go try to get, you know, his autograph and maybe see if I can get something from him for our our group, you know, and, yeah. and perhaps send something around the world, you know, a signed photo or something to our, you know, to our, our, our group or whatever. We'll, we'll see. We might have to change the logo to a, a Lannister lion. Um, if, if he, if he so wishes. No. <laughs> I know we, we have, we have, we have, we have a Stark heavy, but we have some, we have some, we have some Lannister people. Yeah, we do. Yeah. 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 Well, what's neat, uh, you know, well, anyway, so, so on that thought, we, we, Sir Matt and I, when you support us on, on Patreon, that allows us to kind of, you know, save up a little bit of money and, and travel, go to these mm -hmm. places. We would, we would take, we are very, it's a very mobile podcast, actually. I've taken some other projects to, you know, live to Barnes & Noble, to other Comic-Cons, to mm -hmm. conventions. Yep. And so that's really our goal is to kind of get going there. We want to really get our feet wet with all of this, though, and then eventually this fall, you know, and next year try to hit up a lot of the major, you know, cons and, and have some meetups and, and do different things. So when you support us on Patreon, and you write iTunes reviews, you have no idea how much it helps. It's 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 tremendous. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another project I'm working on here, you know, because I know I know George uh, listens to the podcast from time to time. Yeah. Um, there is a first edition book within my grasp, and I am trying to get him to sign it. Yeah, Game of Thrones first edition. <laughs> so I may be uh, uh, dropping a couple hundred bucks. I may be traveling um, to to Santa Fe, mm -hmm. and I might just swing in and see and this. Maybe we could do a giveaway. Uh Oh, <laughs> I was like, I don't know about that. I there like, are things though that we could go get, um, yeah. you know, signed from him. So I'm working on that, guys. Uh, he's going to be, uh, if you keep track of where Gurr is going, he's going to be at Thriller Fest, um, you know, very soon. Uh, I think next week, actually, uh, or in two weeks, he'll be in New York City Thriller Fest. So if you're in the area, it's a lot of money though. Um, but he'll be, he's going to be at a San Jose uh, con coming up in um, in August and things. But we're trying to track him down. We'd like to, you know, get a, get a couple things signed and just go meet the man who really, you know. Um, Got yeah. this all going, man. I just love it. I absolutely love it. So, uh, all right. Any other you know, updates for the show? Anything else, sir, Matt? Uh, no. I think that's that's kind of all. That's kind of all I got. Um, we have uh, some Patreon Black Council stuff starting to work on for um, next month. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I think we're gonna do for those of you who got our care packages for our, our Patreon people. You kind of got that uh, physical kind of newsletter. 
Yeah. We're thinking about doing a uh, digital newsletter for all the Patreon people as well, so you can just kind of get those as we as as we do that. So yeah, we might do like a now newsletter. That I have, now that I sign up, now that we kind of do a little template. Yeah. So um, another thing too, uh, we have plenty. Um, we went ahead and did a mass order of shirts too, so we have tons of shirts. So if you do want to sign up for you know um, and, and, and to get a shirt, let us know. You know, you can sign up there and get access to the Black Council. You know, um, all that goodness. You know, say your nights watch vows, all that good stuff, and get a T-shirt. So. Just let us know. Go out to patreon.com forward slash bend the knee. Sign up there and you should be good to go. Yeah. And uh, well, one last thing here real quick. Uh, Sir Ezra, where can people follow you on social media? Uh, yeah. So a couple different places. Um, obviously, always follow ben, uh, BTK Cast. Um, you know, on our Facebook page, our, our Instagram, Instagram, Twitter. You know, Twitter, you know and then uh, my own personal uh, Instagram is actually Womprat underscore 2M. Uh, W-O-M-P-R-A-T underscore 2M. Uh, and that's the same on Instagram, Twitter, what have you. You can find me under that handle almost anywhere. Yeah, you can find me anywhere on the internet at Super Gains Bros. S U P E R G A I N S B R O S. Uh, that's my Instagram uh, and Twitter, as well as I believe my Tumblr. Actually, my Tumblr might be my name. I can't believe you have a Tumblr. That's great. I actually have a pretty big following. And I, I every know. time I always go look at it, I'm always like, how did I? And I don't get I know. it. I don't yeah. get it. But um, great. anyway, yeah, so just we always get asked that from time to time where people follow us on the internet. So uh, in closing, I think that's about it. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you send those uh, those ravens to btkcast at gmail.com. Um, you know, we've got our show coming up on Monday. And, uh, and again, you know, uh, stay tuned. If you guys have thoughts or comments that you want to send us, you know, things that we can do better on the show or what have you, send us, uh, you know, a message on Facebook or send us a, you know, a raven. So always looking to improve and always trying to, you know, dive into new new corners of, of, of Westeros. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. Man, I want to close out with, uh, what was, uh, here we go. I'm gonna, in, in the words of Sir Grant the Yellow Knight, fit to fight. <laughs>